All right, good morning and welcome to the Vermont Legislature's House Committee on Environment and Energy. This morning we're going to continue our discussions about the budget with uh, Secretary Julie Moore from the Agency of Natural Resources. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I'm going to endeavor to share my screen. That not work. Did we? Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, so I uh, have some slides this morning uh, that are focused really um, for the part of the secretary's office on climate action, but that also dovetails into our work around civil rights and environmental justice. Um, and then we'll turn it over to Commissioner Beeling, who's prepared to, to speak to you about uh, the one time, significant one-time initiatives that are in the Department of Environmental Conservation budget. Uh, I sort of look at the, the governor's recommend as having kind of four um, prongs that reach into the climate space. Um, and we'll talk about each of those, a climate office true up, um, some proposed one-time funding initiatives, role federal funding plays in this, and then a few words about our civil rights and environmental justice unit. Just by way of context, I think it's important to keep in mind there were really significant climate investments um, made by the governor and the General Assembly as part of the final FY23 budget um, that total more than $200 million. There's about $160 million worth of ARPA money um, that we are working to help deploy between now and the end of calendar year 24, as well as $40 million worth of general fund. Um, and it's, it touches on a lot of different agencies of state government, um, from the Public Service Department to the Agency of Transportation, the Office of Economic Opportunity within the Department of Children and Families, Department of Buildings and General Services, along uh, with Vermont Emergency Management and ANR. Um, we are in, they're in various stages, um, but this is just to give you a sense for what those dollar figures were. Uh, that were included as part of the FY23 budget and make clear we'll, we'll need all of the time available to us through the end of calendar year 24 uh, to fully deploy and commit these dollars. So can I pause there and just ask about the various stages? Because there's certainly been some feedback on getting money out the door concerns. And so what are the various stages of, of that? Right. Uh, so there's a a multi-step process for, for the ARPA funds in particular, where they need to be reviewed and approved or <clears throat> assigned a risk level by Guidehouse, which is the contractor the agency of administration is retained to make sure we're complying with federal treasury guidance. Um, several of these initiatives, uh, the expanded weatherization, most notable among them, um, were determined to be moderate risk, um, as well as the uh, municipal energy resilience proposal and so the in risk, it's risk. So they don't want to tell you absolutely this complies with federal guidance or nope, you're in complete violation of federal guidance. Instead, they provide feedback to us on risk. This is a low risk activity. It appears to fully comply with federal guidance. This is a moderate risk activity and explain, you know, modifications we may wish to consider to the program in order to lower the risk level. Um, or leave it as moderate risk and things that they see as high risk. And high risk would mean ultimately federal auditors may say that was not an eligible expense. You charged to these ARPA accounts. We'd like our money back, please. So have other states run into getting kind of dinged on this and finding them not in compliance? Not under ARPA, but under past federal funding programs, there have been instances of being dinged for spending money on ineligible projects and programs that were determined ultimately to be ineligible. Okay, so weatherization is low risk. And so I'm gonna let you finish your sentence. I'm assuming that means we get it out the door. For you. So the part that went through DCF, Office of Economic Opportunity was low risk. The part that was going through BHFA for middle income Vermonters was determined to be moderate risk. Another example of a moderate risk was the Municipal Energy Resilience Program, where it, it didn't appear to fully comply with the federal ARPA guidance. In those instances, we've gone through a secondary process to convert these to revenue replacement, um, which is just the, we are allowed to assume so much of the work state government did in response to the COVID pandemic wouldn't have been done, but for the pandemic. And we're able to essentially treat those money as we're able to reimburse ourselves through ARPA 
and then direct it into these programs, which gets rid of the need to comply with the treasury guidance. That said, it's a several month process to sort of work through that. So we've done revenue replacement in places where we thought, uh, where the feedback we received from Guidehouse on our initial program design was that these were moderate or high risk programs. Um, and we're now in the process of, of putting those dollars on the ground. Many of these initiatives are being run as requests for proposals where we put out a, a solicitation um, and then are reviewing and ranking projects based on the uh, request for funding that, that we receive. Some of them we are administering directly. Um, probably the, the most notable among that is um, some of the investments in working natural and working lands are trying to accelerate adoption of some of our the most climate friendly uh, agronomic practices, cover cropping, changes in tillage practices, et cetera. Um, and so that's really a dramatic expansion of work that was being done in service of water quality and sort of is a double win um, from my perspective in that we're gaining climate resilience benefits as well as quality benefits through that work. Can you tell us on this list that you have, did all of them have to go through the process of kind of rebranding the, the money or? So no, many of them, uh, the weatherization work for, uh, at the highest level, any program that really can be demonstrated to be in service of low income Vermonters is broadly eligible for ARPA. So things like low income weatherization, um, mitigating flood hazards where we're targeting low income neighborhoods or communities, um, providing uh, the electric system upgrades, again, that benefit low, disproportionately benefit low income Vermonters are low risk. Um, if it's not a program that's specifically targeting low risk communities, um, oftentimes it needed to look at revenue replacement to give ourselves that greater flexibility. Deputy Secretary Farnham is unbelievably conversant in all of this um, and would encourage you to, to potentially hear from him because it, it is, it's an art as well as a science and he is very good at it. Okay. So on this list though, the expanded weatherization was high risk. And it was broken into two. two yeah. So there's a, I believe it was $35 million of that 80 million was for low income Vermonters and was going to be administered by DCF. 45 million was going to VHFA for um, moderate middle income Vermonters. The 45 million needed to be go through revenue replacement. The 35 million was fully eligible for ARPA under the treasury guides determined to be low risk. I was just looking for kind of a high level on the list of. I, I can bring that to you. I've also I, yeah, I, uh, I, mixed I, a little, some apples and oranges there in that some of the, for example, the EV related funding isn't all ARPA funding. Some of that is the, the, uh, for it comes out of the $40 million of state general fund that I noted about. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. But I was just trying to give a sense that there is an inordinate amount of work going on right now in this space too, and not to lose sight of that. Um, so in terms of the base budget, I'm calling this a, a part of what's in the FY24 budget is what I would refer to as a climate <coughs> office true up. Uh, as I'm sure you recall, the Climate Action Office was created in the FY23 budget. It includes eight positions in total. Uh, to date, four of those positions are filled. Three are under recruitment as we speak. Um, and the FY24 budget adjusts base funding to meet actual staff salaries. Um, there was also sort of, a, I think, an accounting glitch in the final budget that uh, reduced the Climate Office budget by $100,000 in FY23 as opposed to our environmental <coughs> justice budget, which I think was what was intended, but that's also uh, restored in the FY24 budget. So all told, it's about a $280,000 increase in the base budget for the climate office in the ANR budget this year. Representative Stabilia has a question. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, I apologize, Secretary Moore. On the previous slide, sure. have we done any analysis on the 80 million in weatherization and particularly the uh, funding that is has been converted to revenue um, replacement on uh, that availability to the clean heat standard should that pass um, to be used in the credit markets. Do we have a sense of limitations on that? 
I, I think office. that is entirely within the General Assembly's control. The way S5 is currently drafted, it would give credit for it's a it's a date stamp or a time stamp that drags eligibility for clean heat credits. I believe the time stamp in S5 is past Senate natural was January 1st of this year. Um, so there are some, <clears throat> some of this work did start last year. Uh, but the vast majority, I couldn't say exactly how much of the 80 million, but the vast majority of it would be uh, eligible as for to earn clean heat credits. And just uh, one more question. Uh, should the clean heat standard pass and that sizable $80 million in public funds be available to seed that um, clean heat credit market, what would the effect be on credits? I think that's a complicated question. I'm, I did my own, uh, in the analysis I did, I assumed there was $600 million worth of federal and state um, incentives or cost share provided. And so to my mind, that $80 million would be part of a larger federal cost share package. We know that we are anticipating, for example, an additional $58 million to help with weatherization coming into the Department of Public Service. Um, as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, there are competitive grant programs that we are tracking um, and will be applying for later this year. So, but in in general, it helps uh, reduce the the overall cost of the program. Thank you, so then there are also a series of one-time appropriations related to the climate office. Oh, you want me to go back on? Representative Stevens. Good morning. I apologize I'm late. Um, I'll just have to leave it at that. Uh, you mentioned environmental justice positions in this slide. Does that sound like climate action office? It, it doesn't um, directly, but there is a strong connection between the work of our environmental justice unit and the work of the climate office. The Just Transitions Committee, um, in particular, the, the Climate Council did work that I think is really foundational to the agency's overall approach to environmental justice. And we know that it's going to be sort of a, a fairly constant need to, to make sure that those two efforts remain integrated. In addition, as part of the Climate Office, we have a Community Engagement and Communications Coordinator. Um, we also have two Environmental Justice Coordinators who are in the process of hiring that are also, um, a lot of their work will be community engagement and recognizing that, you know, oftentimes we feel very particular about the information we're trying to take out to the public. The public, on the other hand, sort of looks at the monolith of state government. And so need, know that we need to be coordinated to make sure that that we're speaking with one voice and providing broad-based information that's truly useful to the public. So anticipating that that work will um, proceed in, in fairly close lockstep as we move forward. I appreciate the coordination. Thank you. Because um, I know that the, the Climate Council spent a lot of time um, trying to talk about a lot of items related to that environmental justice piece, and then we passed an additional law last year. But um, if I recall correctly, there are three positions in that? In the EJ unit? Yeah. Yeah. Are those are those one-time funded, or are they prepared? I, I actually have a slide on that at the end, if you okay. want to well, wait. But yes, and the, there's some challenges, which I just want to flag for this, this committee okay. around that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, in terms of one-time appropriations to the Climate Office, uh, there are three, one of which is a $900,000 line item for what I've badged technical analysis tools and training. Um, this is sort of the, the continued work. The General Assembly has previously appropriated um, more than a million dollars to support uh, this sort of technical analysis work being done by the Climate Office. Um, specifically, the, the tasks that are called out are work related to the thermal sector, uh, our measuring and assessing progress tool, which we are uh, in the process of issuing an RFP for right now, the municipal vulnerability index, which we have a contractor working on right now. This would allow us to do the outreach and engagement to municipalities as the tool is complete to help them apply it and review their own risk. And then developing a cost abatement curve for resilience and adaptation. Um, and this is a first step 
Representative Sebelia, I think you'd be particularly interested in, in trying to get us to a better apples to apples comparison between uh, what we know for cost abatement and greenhouse gas mitigation to uh, resilience and adaptation. Work. Um, so each one of these would likely take the form of an RFP and uh, we would be looking for contractor support for these services. The next one-time appropriation that's currently shown in the climate office, although uh, I think it probably better belongs to the public service department. No, we have a question. Sorry, Sorry thank you, Secretary Moore. Uh, just on the thermal sector program, um, can you share with us how that work can complement uh, if we pass uh, S5 or a similar bill this year, how that would help uh, inform Absolutely. So what we have, go, we have the sort of first step in that uh, work that's being done right now. Um, and that is a first a qualitative evaluation of kind of the entire universe of options um, for looking at the thermal sector. So it includes a clean heat standard. Uh, it includes a, an all fuels cap and invest, uh, thermal fuels cap and invest, regulatory programs, so work that my, my agency would do to potentially ban the sale of fossil fuel burning appliances, what it would look like to ex dramatically expand existing programs like the low income weatherization program, et cetera. Um, it, that qualitative review has been completed. We've identified five scenarios that we're gonna evaluate in more detail. Um, this additional funding would allow us to either build out a program design if S5 doesn't come to pass or look at pieces that might be appended to the edges of S5 for it to pass, um, including things like expanding some of the existing programs um, and looking at phasing out the sale of fossil fuel appliances in particular. So recognizing the time and your, where we are, uh, I'm extremely interested in the five. Where would I find them? I will get that to you. Well, <clears throat> uh, so the Clean Heat Homes pro Program, this is, uh, there's an eight and a half million dollar congressionally directed spending award that was secured by Senator Leahy that will go to the EIC and be administered in partnership with VHFA and Vermont Gas. So we are having an echo. <laughs> it's an echo. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And the, the governor's budget proposes to further expand that by an additional $5 million. Uh, the Clean Heat Homes Program is a single point program to help Vermonters do whole home climate improvements and couples that with on-bill financing. Um, so this we're talking about things like weatherization, clean heat systems, uh, electric panel upgrades, sort of everything that, that's needed to support that transition to beneficial electrification. Representative Tory. Thank you. I don't know the answer to that. I can ask and get back to you in a bit more detail. Yeah, Representative Logan. Thank you. Um, and um, does, does the clean heat program, do you know if it includes safety upgrades for things like lead-based paint and asbestos remediation? It, it doesn't unless that's somehow implicated in the weather, a weatherization project. I think that it does if it does. For I think, well, within reason, I was going to say the, the place we see the most nexus between some of the remedial efforts and weatherization is with vermiculite, where there's if that's the asbestos you're referring to. Um, yes, that, that that is intended. It is intended that that could be dealt with as part of a weatherization project. I know a lot of our weatherization programs right now tend to avoid homes with vermiculite insulation, um, and we know we've got to get over that hurdle. So, okay. thank you. You're I actually have a question on that, like on the weatherization piece. Um, it's not necessarily a budget related question, but since we're talking about it, I'm curious. Uh, someone just said to me something about um, the weatherization programs essentially promoting like foam without a, an awareness of the larger greenhouse gas implications of that. Have you heard any of that feedback? I have not. Okay, I'll follow up offline. Okay. Sure. Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I really support this. I, I think it's uh, critical uh, and I really uh, appreciate you highlighting this. I will say we've been studying how to help Vermonters heat their homes for 
centuries. I mean, the first time I started in on, I think it was the Thermal Efficiency Task Force in like 2012. Um, and one of the key points was a single point program. So my question is, uh, great that we're seeing this. My question is, um, do you know how this will flow into the energy coaches that um, some of the uh, like CDOEOs, like Capstone, are um, providing? Basically, they're supposed to help folks understand because for a lot of folks, it's completely overwhelming and confusing. And because of regulatory structures, you know, Efficiency Vermont does this, and Green Mountain Power does this, and so and it's just yes. it's too much. It is. Uh, I, I don't know specifically. Um, I d had just a very high level conversation with folks from Efficiency Vermont to, to understand sort of the benefits of a single point program. Um, but I, I don't know what their exact plans are for dovetailing that with the existing coaches other than potentially expending it because part of this is really trying to get at uh, folks all the way up to who earn less than 120% of MHI. And that's, I think, a more expansive universe than Capstone generally serves. And can you clarify, is, is, are the weatherization agencies, are they 60% and below? Or where do they? I believe it's either 60 or 80%. I'd have to confirm. But it's, it's significantly lower than what's envisioned through this Clean Heat Homes program. Okay. Thank you. Um, another one-time appropriation in the governor's budget is $700,000 for refrigerant management. Uh, this would allow us to leverage an additional $350,000 of funding that's available through VEIC. And this is to work with about 75 stores, we're estimating. Um, the focus is really going to be on general stores and small uh, convenience stores, not, not chains, but individually owned and help those stores phase out their use of refrigerants with high global warming potential. Um, this is anticipated to support things like leak de detection systems, um, actually replacing condensing units, and then working with store owners who own package walk-in units to replace those as well. Um, this is, you know, an overall in our greenhouse gas budget, this is a relatively small sliver. That said, on the sort of per square foot of store basis, these are some really intense emitters or potential emitters um, and the ability to, to take advantage of funding available to VEIC seemed like a, a wise opportunity of resources. Representative Sebelia. Yes. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Just quickly, what's the outreach for this program? Is envisioned? It, it will be done through VEIC. They've initiated some of this work. Uh, they have a general stores initiative, is my understanding right now. Um, and this is intended to expand upon it. And then finally, uh, back to the environmental justice. So the, the governor's budget includes um, funding for environmental justice. Um, some of it is one-time money and some of it is base. Um, these were all things that we had identified as part of the, the book of work of environmental justice. Um, there's $300,000 in one-time general fund to provide an additional year of support for the three staff positions at ANR. As you may recall, um, in passing Act 154 last year, the General Assembly uh, sort of transferred or moved our existing EJ coordinator um, into this particular area of the budget, um, added to supporting positions, but unfortunately provided only one time money to pay for those three positions. Um, so it, it, and it's unclear what the, the intention was. That wasn't the way it had been described to us when we testified on our budget last year. Uh, in addition, we had identified significant needs around the translation of vital documents. I um, believe this work is best suited to the Office of Racial Equity. And so the governor's budget includes um, $2.3 million to help us as a as state government catch up um, in providing translated documents to Vermonters, and then uh, a $700,000 increase in the base general fund to the Office of Racial Equity to continue to support language access on an ongoing basis. Um, I know from our my agency's perspective, we've estimated we probably will have about $100,000 a year worth of needs in terms of language access on an ongoing basis um, to give you a sense for, for what the needs may be statewide. Um, and can you, if you know, give us just a sense so we 
we understand like how many languages are we talking about and how do you select those languages? So it's the, the most common language, most prevalent languages that are spoken in Vermont. Um, so they've been identified by the Office of, of Racial Equity. And what we do, we've also identified uh, a subset of our documents that are determined to be vital and are working to translate them. That said, uh, there is an opportunity for any Vermonter to request translation of a document that we haven't translated um, on a sort of on-demand or on-call basis. Is there like a quantification of how you determine what vital is based on like other, like in English as their primary language, maybe they're, those are the documents most looked at or how do you? No, John, I don't know if you're able to help answer that question, how we determined what vital is. Oh, uh, vital documents. Um, there is a definition. We, we can get there. Okay. Yeah, I don't have that at the tip of my tongue. So we'll get back to you on that. Representative Logan. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions. Uh, so the, um, I need to catch up on this because this is my first year in the legislature. Sure. I was following the environmental justice bill last year, but not that closely. I'm curious, the, um, the EJ positions with e ANR, are they solely focused on environmental justice work in their roles? Uh, the, the coordinator position, which is the position that exists, existed within the agency prior to the passage of Act 154. Part time, right? Well, we, we had proposed in our budget last year to expand it to full time. The governor's recommend included that uh, is a civil rights and environmental justice coordinator position. We also have some, some um, work we're doing to improve our compliance with the federal civil rights policy. The, the two additional positions that were included as part of Act 154 are really focused on environmental justice and community engagement and outreach. Mm -hmm. um, that said, I you know, become very convinced that uh, the civil rights work is really the foundation for a lot of what we need to do in the environmental justice space. And so I don't think it would be accurate to suggest they won't have any role um, in our civil rights work at ANR either. And why, um, why would the governor only recommend um, one, one-time funds here in this budget? So th this is a tough one. We spent a lot of time with this committee as well as the appropriations committees last year talking about Act 154 and had left the legislature with the impression that we would that the funding for the staff positions to support implementation of Act 154 would be base funding. That's not the way the budget arrived to us. We received it as a, we call it a one-time debt ID, meaning that that is the, the type of money. Um, and as a result, aren't particularly sure what the legislature's intention was for funding this work and felt like it was a place for conversation. The governor provided one-time money in his budget um, so that we could go about recruiting the positions as limited service positions that would extend past the current fiscal year. Um, but I think that there is need for a larger conversation about the how this work will be funded in perpetuity um, because there is a large scope of work, including the other items I've listed here um, and no budget provided for it at the current time. And for new members, this committee recommended on uh, that it be in base funding ongoing, just to be clear. So yeah, I, don't, yes. I don't know what happened after I left here, but that was in our, our recommendation. Mm -hmm. There's significant turnover in the appropriations committee this year, right? So it may not be. Well, I think we'll, we can remind them. And we're happy, I'm happy to help flesh um, any of these items out if that would be of use and of interest to the committee. It will be. Representative Logan, Sorry, we may be interrupted. I don't know. Oh, right. We're at the we're at the long pointed hour. <laughs> right. Um, really quickly. So is there an additional request for the other costs related to the EJ work? I'm I'm happy to put one together if, if that would be of, of help to you. Um, it would. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Representative Stevens. Thanks so much. Are there other areas um, besides what you've presented, and, and I pre appreciate the transparency, that are um, one time only. Yeah. So the the complete the completing the mapping tool, I would argue, is one time only. The General Assembly appropriated five hundred thousand dollars. Our best estimate is seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That said, we haven't uh, put the RFP out yet to have a firm number for you. 
Um, and then there's an ongoing cost of maintaining that mapping tool. Um, the advisory, the, the next two items on the list, I think are things that are ready for discussion by the General Assembly. Um, the advisory council having facilitation, contracted facilitation support, similar to what we had for the climate council, um, I think would is advisable. Um, we have uh, worked with the Vermont Council on Rural Development, who's agreed to facilitate our first advisory council meeting, which I think is scheduled for March 10th. Um, but it it puts uh, Carla Ramundi, who's our environmental justice and civil rights coordinator, in a tough position, asking her to both be part of the advisory council and facilitate it. And we're going to reconvene our meeting with Agency of Natural Resources Secretary Moore on the budget. And I, I believe the presentation was completed before we took our break for the drill. And that Representative Stebbins had follow up questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I know we haven't had a fee bill in a while. Uh, and I'm curious how that's impacting, I would assume it's impacting. Um, if it's not, I would. <laughs> I would assume it is because I keep hearing from folks who work in a and that um, they're being asked to do more and more with less and less. So wondering if you can shed some light on that. Sure. So uh, by a and I'm going to assume you mean DEC and may defer to John Beeling. I would note that we uh, had a significant increase in park gate fees uh, that took effect earlier this year, this or no, excuse me, last calendar year. Um, I think about June timeframe, um, which was is predicted to raise about a million and a half dollars of uh, new revenue per year into the, the parks fund. Um, so I don't know that it's accurate to say that that's a separate process, I guess. Um, it, it's, a, it's done through rulemaking as opposed to a fee bill. Um, but just know that we have uh, addressed fees in, in that way um, in the agency. So assuming it's specific to DEC. Um, and appreciating staff are under uh, a lot of pressure right now. Uh, the agency's budget has roughly doubled during my tenure, um, largely due to federal grants and pass-through funds that we are administering. Um, many of those programs have come with additional staff, um, limited service positions. We've added more than 50 limited service positions or been given uh, ability to add more than 50 limited service positions to support the administration of these federal funds. Uh, we are not immune to the workforce challenges, most notably in our business offices. I think the technical positions um, have generally been easier to fill. Um, in that I think people are attracted to the mission of the agency versus grants and contracts administrators are, or financial managers are needed in every <laughs> facet of modern business. Um, and it's a little harder to pull those people into state service um, when they can command a higher salary elsewhere. So we are struggling in that regard. I would actually say, um, Unlike in past times, I think our biggest staff challenge is finding people to do the work as opposed to having positions available, like the positions needed, right? We, um, and John may be able to speak to this in terms of the ARPA funding. I think at this point, we've filled uh, the vast majority of the technical positions, but less than half of the business positions. And it's really um, an issue. Um, in terms of the fee bill, happy to walk you through our environmental permitting fund, um, but we continue to run a positive balance in it. Um, and so it, it's hard, maybe hard to know when is the right time to raise fees, but as long as we're kind of making ends meet, um, I think the, the argument would be this is not yet the right time to, to raise fees. Um, all that said, I don't want to diminish the stress that staff feel at a &R right now. It is an incredible amount of work um, that we're endeavoring to, to take on. Um, climate Office and Environmental Justice Unit being new components of work, both of which came with staff, but starting new things is always hard. And I really do think it's a reflection of the 
absolutely enormous amount of federal funds um, we are working to, to administer right now. Related to that, um, so if someone retires or feels like they can say, do you, do you, are you able to post that immediately? And I, I'm asking from a perspective of when I've worked in state government, like sometimes we had many months of deferral and just wondering what that process is. Um, you know, when someone retires, the, the person I worked for had a very focused effort. She said, whenever something goes empty, the budget is taken away. So I'm just wanting to make sure that when someone retires, does that position go away? Is that vacancy? Are you posting that immediately? So when someone retires, generally the expectation is the, the commissioners and division directors will review the position and make sure it, it's the best use to meet current needs um, and uh, complete an RFR request for reclassification if needs have changed. Um, some of that is also, you know, people who've spent, who have been career civil servants um, might retire at, say, an environmental analyst nine. And in reality, we may be best served by recruiting for a, a more entry level position of somebody who could once again progress through the civil service system. Um, that is something that's left to, to commissioners and division directors to, to work through. Uh, our budget always contains a, a reasonable amount of vacancy savings. Rarely, if ever, have we had resources to double fill positions. And so you do actually have to wait for the position to become vacant in order to recruit for the next person. Um, I want to say that the, on average, we're looking at eight to 12 weeks between when someone departs and uh, the, the position is, is filled. Um, so there's... There is time in there where we're accruing vacancy savings. Uh, there were years in the past where, um, particularly in the early stages of COVID, where, where we used vacancy savings as a budget tool because there was so much uncertainty, but have moved away from that. Um, and our FY24 budget reflects um, the, I guess I would say, the uh, an amount of vacancy savings that reflects sort of standard hiring procedures uh, with, within the agency, just the normal delay between when somebody leaves and when we're through the other end of the recruitment process. Um, some of those recruitments are, are more extended now than they've been in the past. We've had a number of positions recently that have had to go out more than one time for recruitment for want of good candidates, again, particularly in our business offices. So it, it, there's workforce issues bound up in an answer to that question too. Thank you, but to, to, be, to be clear, like a past practice during COVID of holding a vacancy to, to sort of depress the budget. That's not happening anymore. Not um, at my direction. I don't want to say that, that there aren't individual division directors or program managers that are making decisions in that regard um, as in, in order to manage their own budgets. But it is at the beginning stages of COVID, I absolutely put out a memo and said no hiring without my explicit approval. And that's been rescinded. And so now to the extent that's occurring, it's it's occurring at a at the program and division level. Thank you. So actually uh, I have a follow-on. I think um so the I'm hearing like I, I understand there's a lot of money going out, it's one-time money, but at the same time, our permit programs are under increased stress because of just increased development pressure that's happened. And I, I guess I'm wanting to know or get at like. What's have the staffing levels in those programs changed? I mean, if there's a, you're saying there's a surplus in the permitting fund, where is that coming from? Or there's I wouldn't describe it as a surplus. I just say we're we're not running it into the red yet. So we're still living within our means. Um, there were administrative, so-called administrative positions that were created as part of ARPA. Uh, many of those have gone into permitting programs. So, for example, the Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection Program has added staff in anticipation of increased numbers of applications coming out of the Healthy Homes Program. Uh, we added staff capacity in the Office of Planning, which is part of the Secretary's office, anticipating additional projects through Act 250. Um, I believe there's a staff person that's been added in the Wetlands Program. Um, as well as one in the stormwater program. So we, we have, in addition to the um, team providing direct technical assistance related to the implementation of the dollars, the federal dollars that are available, we have also added uh, 
administrative isn't the right word, but regulatory staff capacity um, so that we're, we maintain our ability to, to work through permit applications in a, a reasonable amount of time. I didn't, I didn't hear you mention this, the on-site program. That's the drinking water and groundwater protection program. It's part of that division. Okay, thank you. Representative Sevilla and Bongarts. Yep, uh, the overall vacancy rate for the agency right now. I don't know, but I can get that and get back to you. Okay, and uh, also noted uh, the positive balance um, as a result of fees. And I think we're looking at a fee bill being reviewed um, this year. And so <clears throat> I, would, I would actually like more information on the positive balance in fees, what that means kind of uh, some sort of accounting or the opportunity to follow up with someone in agency on that. Yeah, uh, it, the, someone may actually be <laughs> seated immediately here to my left. Um, Commissioner Bieling can speak to that. And, and I think perhaps, um, and I apologize, Chair Sheldon, if this was the part of the presentation you were looking for today, I was just going to try to pull up a little bit of our budget overview. Um, so I say that, that has kind of the, the funding picture for the agency. And I, just, I, I think it's important to keep in mind, part of the problem is none of our programs, maybe I, I don't believe any of our programs, I want to be a little circumspect, rely fully on fee revenue, right? And so there are questions that the General Assembly I put to the Department of Finance and Management about which programs don't pay for themselves. It's a really hard question for us to answer because there are almost no programs that pay for themselves within the Agency of Natural Resources. We rely on a combination of permit fees, general funds, and federal funds. Uh, we are increasingly challenged by flat federal funding. It has been flat throughout my tenure, and I think at this point it's been flat for more than 10 years. <clears throat> um, which means that the two places that make up the effectively declining federal funds as a result of infl inflationary pressure are permit fees and general funds. Um, and uh, our permit fund continues to, to remain in the black. Um, I think reasonable people could look at different approaches um, for how you would determine when a fee bill was needed, um, but certainly the, the administration's review is that it, it isn't timely at this point, um, given the balance we maintain in that fund. I'm not going to be able to quickly pull this up. Oh, I know where it is. Just I have a chart that may help. Sorry, I <laughs> can't talk in. It's fine. PowerPoint. I'm giving you a little space to find it because I know that is. You're not seeing my screen. All right. Um, share screen. Does she have share screen? Yeah. I think I do. I think I just have to make this bigger first. I can share my screen. Share this. Um, so. This is the presentation we're working on for House Appropriations for next week. This is just the governor's budget, high level for the agency. But I think this is the figure that may actually, you know, this paints that this is a complicated picture, right? This is the different types, flavors of money that fund the work of the agency. Um, we get about, we get more than $90 million in federal funds. That's across all three departments. We get about $36 million in general funds. And then the, the rest of these funds uh, over here are what would be considered permit funds, special funds, um, things that come into us through tax revenue, like the, the gas tax. Um, so it's, it's a pretty complicated stew. And I just, I don't want you to feel like I'm avoiding answering your question, but it's not, there isn't a linear response to, to what's being asked. Um, and it's how all of these sources sort of level, level out over time that determines whether or not um, we sort of meet our budget target. And our first objective is to maximize our ability to draw down and fully deploy federal funds. 
Um, and then we look to kind of backfill against that with our special funds and general funds to make our budget whole. Representative Bongart. I'll hold off. Representative Tory. Thank you. Um, this background the workforce discussion has, um, how has accommodating been affected in terms of what the applicant experiences in terms of long takes? Has there been a trend? I, I, I believe the trend is paused. Oh, sorry, John Beeling. Uh, I hear when things are bad, and I don't hear very much. So anecdotally, and, and speaking with my directors, I think permitting is going pretty well. I think one thing that's really helped us is we moved many of the permits to online application. And especially during COVID, that was very challenging when people mailing things. We don't have people in the office all the time. It, that, that caused some log jams. But... Since then, I think things are going very smoothly, and the expectation is that really everything's going to be online eventually. We're, we're, we're getting there. There's a few that, that because of federal requirements, we, we actually can't do that, strangely enough. But other than those, I, I, I predict probably the next couple of years, virtually everything's going to be online, which is way more efficient, and we can get, we can get the things out uh, pretty quickly. And we've enjoyed really strong support and partnership with the General Assembly in making that transition over the, the last three years with resources provided. We have, we refer to it as ANR Online, and it's sort of our, our tool for allowing, accepting online payments and applications. And we've been able to make some significant investments in improving and expanding that system um, since the onset of COVID, which has been a, a gift to the agency that will keep paying dividends long past our ability to come back in the office. One more question. I know you need to go, Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I, I recall hearing, actually, maybe this is for Mr. Green, but um, uh, there have been times where different areas of a &R, like one will say it's okay, and other one um, won't be able to get to it, but because of the way the queue is structured, that projects can be delayed and delayed and delayed or think that they're fine and then it comes back um, and they have to redo everything. Can you guys touch on that again? So, yeah. so we have come up with a system. It's called Permit Navigator. It's an online system and it's designed to really help people out. A lot of those times, someone will come in and they'll get a stormwater permit and they'll find out after the fact, oh, I also need a weapons permit. So that, that's really the problem. We, we, you know, we're not really set up and there are there are you know folks you can call to help you out with permitting. So we, we have live you know people you can call to say I'm I'm doing this in Montpelier. What what are the permits I need? There's still folks who do have that job, but we also have an online capability. So we're we're trying our best to make sure people know the whole landscape when they when they want to when they want to put forward some some kind of project that they put in their applications at the same time. A lot of times it's staggered. So they'll they'll start on something and they realize oh I got to do this kind of permit. Oh I got that kind of permit. And so, you know, each one takes a certain amount of time. If we get them all in the door at the same time, yeah. they should move forward pretty consistently. Some permits, frankly, are less complicated than others. Some take a lot more work, a lot more engineering, a lot more. It's just, they're just harder. Some permits are pretty straightforward, you know, just like show us this and we can issue. But so that's, that's the effort is to try to make sure people come in as comprehensively as possible so we can. And we do also through the Office of Planning, that's Billy Coster's team in the Secretary's Office, offer what I would sort of refer to as a concierge service for larger, really complex projects, particularly ones that go beyond DEC and also implicate some of the interests of uh, fish and wildlife or other agencies of state government um, and do quite a bit of outreach to folks, encouraging them, um, you know, for example, uh, regular meetings with the ski areas, presentations at Renewable Energy Vermont, uh, working with housing developers, <clears throat> working with the electricity utilities to encourage them to come in early when they have big projects in the offing, like even before they're kind of fully developed to give us a heads up so that we can start to work through the process with them. Um, it's a learning experience for all of us, but I think in general, people are, are taking us up on that offer more and more. Um, and it is not only to their benefit, I think it's to our benefit too. Um, thank you for coming in. You're welcome. Uh, we, we may very well ask you to join us again. Oh, I am always happy to. Can we get that? Thank you. Slide set? You, you do have it. Oh, we have it. I actually okay. emailed it out to everyone oh, okay. last night. That's what I sent. Them, that we okay. reached out to our appropriations. Oh, and you got the budget book. Yeah.
Okay. So yes. I, I highly recommend members review those documents and then see if you have further questions on the budget. Yeah, I apologize for the misunderstanding and I'm happy to come back. Yeah, um, me too. Uh, let us take a five minute break and we can transition to our next witness meeting and welcome Commissioner John Beeling from the Department of Environmental Conservation to continue our look at the budget. Good morning. Uh, thanks uh, for having me here. Again, for the record, John Beeling, uh, DEC Commissioner. Um, there's three uh, topics I'd like to go over this morning. One is our, our Healthy Homes Initiative. Uh, second is uh, some additional brownfield funding. And the third is uh, some more funding for, for PFAS. And I know uh, when I came to the Budget Adjustment Act, we talked a little bit about uh, initiation of the PFAS private well sampling. This is really just a continuation of that. Um, the Healthy Homes Initiative has, has been really one of the most successful programs I've ever been around. Um, we, when we started it up, we, we really had no idea the need out there. You know, we, we just based upon data that we had with, you know, known failures, investigations and the like, we, we thought we'd get, you know, a few hundred. And the, the response when we announced the program was, was overwhelming. Uh, we had people getting, I think one, one at that point, only had one phone number. I think she got three, 300 emails or 300 uh, voicemails in one weekend. Um, just to give you a sense, so there's there's a ton of need out there, and so there's really there's two components uh, to the program. The first is the um, so it was started just to to go back. We started it with some ARPA funds, um, and then we were fortunate enough to get some more funding uh, from this body uh, to keep it going. Our, ARPA kind of got us off the ground. We just again had no idea what we were looking at. So you know what what it focuses on for individuals. It's called the on-site program. That's for wastewater systems and uh, drinking water supplies. Uh, a lot of the, the need is in the wastewater sector. Um, as many of you may know, unfortunately, it's very expensive to replace a septic system. It goes something like $30,000. And there's just so many people in Vermont who cannot afford that. And they just weren't fixing their systems. And so some of the stories I've heard are, are kind of heartbreaking. You know, people were living in, in really, you know, substandard, very substandard conditions, and a lot of them had kids. And so um, it really, it's it's a direct impact to people. A lot of things that, that we do, the impacts are more long-term and they're less visible in the short run. This is short-term impacts. And we've seen just, you know, a great response and, and it's been it's been a, a tremendous success. Um, this is the on-site program. This is just to kind of give you an overview of how it works. Um, it's it's income-based. There's a couple of tiers set up based upon income. Um, a lot of folks that are coming in are, are very low income. They, they easily meet these criteria. And so, you know, we go out, we figure out whether they have a failed system, we work with them, we help them fund the assessment, and then we, we provide uh, monies to the contractors to actually replace the systems. Um, just to kind of give you some, a, a sense of what I'm talking about, 54% reported household income of less than 30,000 per year. 89% reported household income of less than 50,000 per year. Okay, so these are the vulnerable people we're talking about. Um, Representative Stevens. You know, it's household, like four, <laughs> you get four? It's, or? It's, it's household income, however many people live there. It's so could usually, you know, usually it's, it's usually two people or one person. Okay, so thank you. Um, but this, just to kind of give you a sense, so, so the benefits that we've already been able to achieve, we've uh, approximately 625 Vermonters, 145 seniors, over 150 children. Um, we've kept the funding going. We, we have enough money to keep going for a bit, um, but it's going to run out. I mean, th this is something, this isn't going away, right? The, the, we're not, we're not going to be in a situation where we could just like declare victory and move on. These things keep failing. And this this is something that's gonna be with us for a long time. And I can tell you, having been a lawyer for the department, it's one of the most frustrating things. You, you bring an enforcement case. Well, how do you bring an enforcement case against someone with these kinds of resources? What are you gonna do, right? You, you, they can't afford to fix it. They certainly can't afford a penalty. And so it's just, a, it's a waste of time, you know? So this is so much better. This is so much better use of government resources than taking kind of the, the, the top-down punitive approach. It just doesn't work. It works for, individuals and, 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 you know, commercial enterprises that have money. But for people like this, this is how to do it. And it's been really uh, a tremendous success. 
Um, so that that's really help, you know, alongside healthy homes. Mm -hmm. So what we've asked for an additional 10 million, um, we'll use it, um, we'll use it. So um, I think it's something that we really should keep going as long as we can. Um, this is a, a new that question. Sure. Healthy homes. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I have a question for you. Um, I'm just curious in terms of uh, changing climate, more water, more rain. Is there any <coughs> best practices that have changed as a result in terms of septic? Like, should we be, when we invest in new ones, should they be bigger? I don't know if climate change, I can ask that question of folks who, who would know. I, I've not heard that. Um, I do know that standards keep improving. You know, a, a system that you put in today would look a lot different than something you put in, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So they are designed to have a longer lasting life um, now. I think hey, that's one area I do think technology has really improved. So they should last longer. These should last longer. I'm hoping we don't have to come back and fix these in 20 years. But, you know, some do fail because of other conditions. But most of these are, are pretty old. You know, these are from older housing, a lot of older housing stock, and they've been in use for a long time, and eventually they fail, you know. Representative Seven. Thanks, Senator. Um, what's the geographic spread of this? Uh, it's you know, one statewide. Of the, it's, it's statewide, but one of the things I often hear being from Burlington is that, you know, there are rural communities that are Really hurting and struggling, and I'm just curious how much this is like, how much this is really uh, reaching out to folks that may not know about it um, and uh, could really use it. So we've done a lot of outreach. I can get you some data in terms of where where they're, they're, they've been installed. I, I just know because I've worked on a few. Sometimes some issues come up. So I've worked on some way up in the kingdom. I've worked on a bunch of rural areas. So I, I know that there's a lot of rural. Getting to folks is, is another issue. That's, that's something we're really trying to, to be aggressive about and get the word out. I would urge all of you to reach out to your constituents. I mean, that, that's what we need. We need people to find out because a lot of our, a lot of our communications are online. A lot of these folks, are, they're not using it, you know, or they're using it for very limited things. So that's a good point. And, I, and it's something that, that this division, it's called the Environmental Compliance Division. They're the ones, um, it's a compliance assistance office. They're really working hard to make sure we get to as many people as possible. A lot of it's getting out by word of mouth. You know, I, I know that, that, you know, someone will get their system fixed. They'll tell their neighbor, we'll tell a neighbor, and then we'll get these clusters of people saying, geez, I can get a, I can get a new system. I don't have to pay for it. And so it, it, it's working, but you're right. I mean, the more people we can reach with this information, the better. Representative Clifford. And Thank you, Madam Chair. And does that include, does the funding include coverage on like mound systems or pump systems if they need or I, just a typical I don't convention. I don't you know that's a good question I can find out the answer specifically but I I, I don't know that we I think as long as it's an, it's an approved system I don't think we're dictating it. if a designer will come in and say here's this appropriate system for this house I don't think we're holding up we're not saying it has to be to these specs I think as long as it's a, you know license these are licensed folks right, right. so they, right. they've got their licensure yeah. and they'll say to us this is the appropriate system so I don't believe we're saying no you can't do that we're saying if it works and it's approvable we're good Thanks. Yeah. Representative Morris. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Commissioner, for coming in. Um, on, on the marketing side of this, and you just mentioned that we could reach out to our constituents yeah. and our advertisements. Do, do we reach out to the uh, community health officers uh, as a possibility to I don't know the answer to that. Or septic companies. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I know, I don't believe we've been working with the septic companies because that gets a little tricky. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I could find out whether there's been outreach to the, to the health officers. The health officers might be a, an app. Yeah, that's a good question. Oh, I, I can find that out. Thank you. Representative Bongards. So um, why were the 600 rolled over to this year? Is it because of not enough funding to them last year, not enough staff? We just couldn't get to them. Just couldn't get to them. We just couldn't get to them because of staff thing. Or yeah, just you know, there's only they, they take a little while to process. So so, um, but we're 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 going forward. We're not stopping. We've got some funding. We're not like we're not we haven't run out. But how do you how do you find the, who finds the contractors to do this? I believe you know it's up to the homeowner, but I. I 
I'm pretty sure we're permitted. You have to be very careful about, you know, picking and choosing. I think we can provide lists, like basically lists. Here, here are folks who can do this kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. But we can't say go to go to dealing septic, right? Because that's okay. So another aspect of healthy homes is uh, relates to manufactured home housing communities. You know, manufactured housing communities in Vermont are um, they tend to have a lot of problems around wastewater, drinking water. They're often not particularly well funded. Some are privately owned, some are owned by co-ops. Um, but traditionally, they, they've been very difficult, like I was saying, with a homeowner. It's the same thing with the manufactured housing community. We'd come in, we'd find problems, and they just can't pull it together. It's, it's the residents, typically, right? It's going to either come out of their rent or a lot of times their owners. Or it's a, a co-op system. So there's just not enough money to improve these systems. And, and they are, I don't know, if, I think I might have mentioned this at the last time I was here, but I, I believe it was 40% or maybe even more of the property damage uh, caused by Tropical Storm Irene were in manufactured housing communities. They, they're vulnerable. And so they, they bear the brunt. And, and there's a lot of lower income folks living in these communities. And so again, this is a great way to improve their quality of life, their, 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 their health, the, you know, safe drinking water, safe wastewater disposal. Um, so there's there's a and this is uh, this is really kind of not this isn't unique but I, I think it's a really uh, it's a very positive feature we, we help them you know one of the problems you see in Vermont is you know, even if there's like now if there's a lot of funding available a lot of folks aren't really they're not that focused on getting it or they don't really have the means to get to it so we're helping them helping them figure out what their needs are so that's that's one of the the first item here, it's a needs assessment services. So we will pay for an environmental engineer to go out and take a look at the MHC and figure out what it is that they need. Because otherwise, usually someone has to do that up front before they apply for a grant. They've got to go out, get a consultant, say, here's what we need, here's your grant application. So the more sophisticated operations, they're ahead of this game. These are folks who aren't there, right? So we're trying to help them so they can come to us and help them figure out what they need. Same thing with technical assistance and permitting. Permitting can be confusing, as everybody is recognizing. So we're, we're helping them with the whole permitting process. You know, these are much bigger pro projects than just installing a septic system or, or a drinking water well. Right? These are these can be pretty large. Some of these manufactured house communities are, are pretty big. And so you've got to go through a whole uh, design and permitting and get to get it ready for construction. And then the last piece is we will help them up to one point two five million dollars uh, fund build build out the, the water. This is water infrastructure that includes wastewater. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, John, the, the, the needs assessment services, 40K. I mean, is this something you guys do in house or is this something that you no, we pay so much. Oh, you do it in house? No, we pay. Oh, you're paying 40K pay. enough? 40k, you know. I mean, you're talking engineering service. I yeah, think. well, if you got you kind of break it up between needs and then technical assistance. So, so when you combine the two, we can go up to about 115,000. That, that's, you know, I'm not in that business, so I don't, right. I can't tell you specifically whether it's enough. I don't think we've had a lot of problems with people telling us that's not enough money. I haven't heard that. So it, it seems like it's working. It's I mean, I dealt with engineers before. I mean, I yeah. Don't think it can get expensive. Yeah, 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 I agree. That's why I have, that's my question. Yeah. So, I, but, you know, I think, you know, we tried to base it upon, you know, past experience, you know, we do deal with these folks a lot and, you know, we, we consult with them. So I think I haven't had anybody come back and say, look, this isn't enough. You need to up these numbers. So right. that's, right. that's what I'm basing it on. Thank you. Yeah. Next one. So just to give you a sense in the 2022 funding cycle, we had 39 applications. Over 90 projects, 36 were selected. Uh, put out 12.6 million in funding to address 48 projects. 11 of them were needs assessments for 440,000, 26 technical assistance. See that that's where it gets big, 1.27, and then 19 construction grants, almost 11 million dollars. So these projects will benefit 4,000 residents, 1,000 seniors, over 800 children. So again, we're getting to like this is this is environmental justice to me. This is how it should work. You know, we're getting to the people who really need it, who wouldn't get it otherwise. I mean, th these things just, they're really hard to get, and it's really hard to set them up, and it's hard to, to get the granting. 
So it, it's just been a tremendous success. So I, I, I think it's something that, that we should really just keep working on because like I said, it's not going away. Do you have a sense of the need that's out there? We must know how many of these communities there are. You know, I, I, I can get you that. I, I know that we, we do know how many MHCs there are out there. So I can find out kind of our estimates going forward. That would be great. Yeah. Representative Tory. You mentioned um, the devastation from tropical spring rain. Are these types of investments hardy enough for Irene to? <clears throat> you mean for like um, resilience? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that needs to be part of an engineering design nowadays. You know, it, it, there's a recognition, and any professional engineer will tell you that. If you're, if you're building in a floodplain, you've got to take certain steps to make it more resilient. Can you completely prevent what happens when an Irene happens? No, but you can try to make it as resilient as possible. My screen has frozen. So I'm, uh, I think I've been pretty much a healthy one. The other two, the slides were very brief. You can tell this was put together by my division director. I put the other slides together. And I, the quality is, is there's an appreciable decline. So I, I use that. Uh, you know, I, I didn't, I, the last couple of slides were, 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 weren't even, I'm going to send you the, the whole slide deck, but they, these are, they're frankly a little more straightforward. This, this is a more complex process. The other two, any more questions on, on healthy homes on either? Oh. The, we have slides up on our webpage. Are they different from what you? I, I added a couple of slides. Okay. They're very brief. Okay. I, mean, I can do it just off the top of my head. It's not, you know, it's really just on the PFAS and brownfields. And so on PFAS, you know, we, we talked last time about the initiation of this process to get out there and sample 500 wells. I think we're up to over 100 volunteers at this point, last I heard. So we're getting there. Uh, we'll start sampling pretty soon. So, sorry, so, I missed the beginning because I was a little distracted. Um, say the numbers again, please. So, so for PFAS, yep. um, we, there, you know, this was something we had to do anyway. So we were, we were in the process of getting ready to do it. This litigation against 3M and DuPont kind of pushed us along because the, the, the experts in that case need five. They, they're saying they need, well, 500 is ideal statistically significant sampling so they can model and say how many private wells are impacted in the line. So that's that's what that is. Then we step in as the regulators. And so what we're proposing is to fund, certainly for the first, you know, we're, we're estimating about 75 of the first 500 will be contaminated based upon what we've seen other parts of the state. Then you've got to kind of draw a circle around impact and water supplies and figure out how many additional wells will need remediation and we're, we're estimating about 650 just just based on that effort right that's not counting someone who takes a water sample on their own that's just us going out you know doing the 500 doing the circle so we're, we're thinking we're we're expecting to find up to 650 wells that will need remediation and so the cost for that I think that we talked about it last time the, the installation of the poet system is about thirty five hundred dollars that's a one-time cost but operation and maintenance of a poet system is about twenty five hundred dollars per year which is expensive for a lot of people so our our proposal is to put in the systems deal with the first 500 and then expand it beyond so we, we think we're gonna have around 650 and so the money we're seeking is to pay for poets in a couple of years of O and it's going to depend upon how many wells test positive? We, if we have enough, we'll keep O and going as long as we can. But you know, realistically, if you if you cost it out completely, it's it's over twenty million dollars. If you did it for like twenty or thirty years, so it's, there's a significant cost associated, really, with the operation. The investigation is not cheap either. So, I just am curious about about uptake. You sent the letters out last time we heard from you, and then I, yes. there were we had members of this committee were interested and maybe concerned even about it. So just you send out how many letters and then what's been the response? 750 letters have gone out. And 100 have said. Uh, last I heard was 100, but that was last week. They're, they're, a lot came in right away. And now we seem to be getting, you know, I, I want to say around 10 or so per week. So was there a sort of an RSVP opt out also or just people who want in? This is completely voluntary. No, I know. But is it, are you only hearing from people who want in or? Yes. OK. Yes. Okay. I mean, I think some people have contacted us with questions and then decided not to opt in. I mean, there, there's a number they can call. They could ask, like, well, what does this mean? And so I think some people are rather not know. That's, you know that's, that's the way some people think, and that's fine. That's why it's voluntary. Um, 
So that's that's the, where the, the 10 million for the, the PFAS comes from. You know, again, you know, it's kind of like healthy homes. It's not going away. So we put in, how much did we put in the budget adjustment though? And then and how much? Three million. And now we're asking for 10 more. 10 is, 10 is kind of take us past that. That's really just the first 500 and then associated investigation and poet. So that's to get us off the ground. So when people come to us, we say you're above 20 parts per trillion for these compounds, we can act. And then, you know, it, gradually we're going to get to more and more. And then, you know, where, you know, where there's a, a deficit or a hole right now is for people who do it on their own. This is only set up for when we're doing the investigation. If someone does it on their own, there's, there's no, there's really nothing in, in resources. There's been a lot of press on this kind of nationally. I know in Massachusetts, there, there's a lot of problems with people testing their wells and then there's no funding available for them. So I think that's another issue for down the road. Yeah. Um, and so a legitimate one. If someone wanted to opt in but didn't get a letter, could they call? That's, yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I think because we did it, we needed to be very mindful of kind of geographic you know, uh, distribution. I mean, I guess it's conceivable if we don't get to the 500, we could reconsider that. Um, that that's, that's, a, that's a good question, actually. I, I don't, you know, we'll have to see if that's where we end up. Representative Sevilla. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you speak to the work that is ongoing uh, and the budget line item um, related to uh, uh, folks that just opt in to test um, themselves and that there's no funds? I'm presuming that the agency is thinking about how we're going to deal with that in the future, developing some planning for that. Where would we see that in your budget? That is not in this budget. So I, I think that is, I think this will really help inform us about what we're working at, right? So once we get through this process, we're going to have experts telling us, we think, pick it up, 10%, whatever, some percent of your private wells. At that point, we can say, okay, we've dealt with probably at that point, 1%, right? So we'll be able to get some numbers together. It's okay, here's where we think we're going to be. So we're basing this upon, you know, 500. 75 and then up to 650 you know so that's the numbers for now if they come back and tell us you know we think the number is again it's, it's very hard to predict you know i think new hampshire has seen some very high numbers certainly in southern new hampshire very high percentages if we're like new hampshire that's going to be a giant number if, if we're smaller than that then i think we'll be prepared but I, you know my own view is that this is something this is not a traditional you know, I've been doing this a long time. So the, the old mantra was make the polluter pay. Well, to me, somebody who washes their clothes and PFAS comes off their clothes and gets into a septic tank, they're not a polluter to me, right? Even though technically they caused it. So under the old, you know, system, you said you got to pay for it. It's coming from your septic system. It's not something I'm really excited about promoting. It is the way the law works right now. It is. And so it's a very, it's a very draconian statute. And so, you know, and it's a good statute overall. I just think there's certain situations where it makes sense. And, you know, ultimately, you know, uh, my hope is in my wood that from this case, we can get a lot of money to, to fund this. And that's, that's ultimately where I, I really hope we could end up. We have a fund dedicated to this <clears throat> fund administrator and basically people test voluntarily and they go to the fund. That's, that's the great, uh, that's where we're all, that's where we all want to see this thing at. There's no guarantee. So it could end up being us, um, but just the dynamic now, so I understand is technically if someone tests it all well, they're, they're on the hook for cleaning it up. That's the way this, the law works. Uh, two questions. So one, uh, I'm gonna, one is around federal. Let me go back to on the hook. So you test your own well, you find PFAS. Are you obligated to address that? At that point, you under, under state law, Right. You're the owner of a property, owners of property upon which there's been a release of hazardous materials are strictly liable for the cleanup of that material. That's the way the law, that's the way the law has worked for 40 years. So being obligated to pay for it is one thing. Being obligated to do it is another thing. So are you obligated to? You're obligated to address it. I don't think anybody would, would force someone to install a poet system, right? It's their own house. But technically, at that point, you come into the system and you've got to you've got to figure out you know you're supposed to determine where it came from, et cetera. Right? What we're dealing with this. I mean, we're 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 not ready. We're not. I don't believe any. I don't believe this has happened yet. 
Okay, I don't think anybody has come to us as I tested my own well, and here's what happened. They're not, you know, they, I don't believe that's happened. So I don't want to raise any alarms here. I'm just saying this, this is the big picture here. So as part of this program, we, we're going to pay for it. Down the road, we're going to need to figure some things out. So, so I, I heard you say we're dealing with it, perhaps to the concern that you were seeing up here. We're dealing, we're dealing with, with this by, you know, we're dealing, you know, basically at this point, we are only having, you know, we're paying for all the cleanup for things that we test. If somebody comes in the door and says, I've got a PFAS sample, we're going to need to figure that out. It hasn't happened yet, to my knowledge. So that was really my original question. Yeah. So where, so how, what is the kind of, what is the size of figuring it out that is going on right now? Is there a person thinking about this? Is there a planning process is there, thinking about this? A lot of people thinking about this. So that would be me. That would be my division director. That would be my general counsel. So we're, we're all thinking about this. This, this is a really challenging area. It just is because, you know, fundamentally, this is the way these statutes work, right? This is the way they're set up. So somebody, you know, someone buys a property, doesn't perform property due diligence, and they buy it, and it's got contamination on it. They, they're required to clean it up. It's not a happy thing to go through. I've had to go through it many times, but it's the way the law works. You know, so you're, we're talking about kind of a new, you know, a new dynamic here. And so, you know, we're going to need to manage this and figure it out. But like I said, I, I'm not aware of anybody coming in and saying, I have PFAS in my well, well you know, and I don't, I don't believe anybody has gotten what's called a, a, a first letter, which tells them that they've got to do X, Y, and Z. I don't, I don't think that's happening. Are any Vermont property owners required to test for PFAS? No, so not. child care centers, oh. hospitals, schools? Public, yeah, I'm talking private landowners. Yeah, no, for, for any kind of public drinking water supply, yes. Everyone has been, ever, we, that, that's, is a requirement, yes. And then, uh, by and large, they're paying for it. They're paying for the installation of the public systems. So, child care, a private yep. child care yep. system. Yep. What I'm hearing is disincentivized uh, testing to find out if, if it's a, If it's a public drinking water supply, they're required. That, that, that's private. But if it's if it serves. 25 or more people, it's by definition a public drink water supply, whether it's privately owned or publicly owned. So anybody who's running a child care center that serves more than 25 people is already required to test for PFAS, and we have found it. And if you're serving 20, you're not required. And so what's is there a liability on that? Um, they have to address it. Anybody who, you know, you mean to the state or just overall liability? They don't, well, they don't. If they choose not to test and there's PFAS in their water, I mean, I can't really give you a legal opinion, but I would think there'd be people who are upset if their kids were going there and somebody decided not to test and there was a problem. So my second question, we're going down that rabbit hole, which is uh, really satisfactory, that's really concerning, um, is around where we could expect answers to come from. Will they be at the federal level, at the state level? Is there federal work on this? Are you waiting uh, for federal programming and funding? No, it's waiting for Godot. No, we're not waiting for defense. We, we have to act. They're getting there. They're, they're pretty far behind us. You know, states have really led on PFAS. Vermont's one of the Vermont, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Michigan, a bunch of states that are way out of the feds. Are. So the feds are catching up. But you know, if you're talking funding, I'm not expecting that the feds are going to come through. I, mean, I shouldn't say that. There is, there is, uh, there are some federal funds designed to address emerging contaminants, and so that that's another possibility going forward is to draw on those funds and use those for for these types of situations. And the litigation that the private well testing has brought us um, would it would it also get to what Representative Sibelius is talking about, the, um, the commercial, the public water supplies. We're only looking at private wells. Our, our, well, I understand the testing is only looking at it, but if the litigation comes through, yeah. well, what could the fund be? Could the funding for, then also be used for those other? I guess it really is going to depend on how big the fund is. Yeah. Now, if there's enough money, certainly, but if, if it's limited, then I think we would direct it to based on need. 
And, and that's something we thought about here, but it's really complicated to, to base this on, on need because it's not like healthy homes where someone applies, you can take a snapshot of their living situation and a, a supply mm -hmm. grant. Because you have ongoing operational maintenance, people's circumstances change, and you're really setting up a whole program that we're really not staffed to, to do. We're just, that's not how we operate. So it, that we thought about that, like, well, let's do it based on need. That way we could stress the money out a little bit longer. But that gets very complicated in this kind of situation. So we're just saying we're estimating we could probably pay for a couple of years and then see where we're at with the litigation. Representative Clifford, I think. Did. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the uh, program, the PBAS volunteer program, yeah. you know, sent out the letters, say 700 letters? 750, I think. Okay. So is that based on the $3 million that was in the budget or the $10 million ask? The, the, so that's the that's the starting point. So the 750, the 3 million is what we're estimating will cost, that's what it'll cost to do the uh, poet installation for the, the houses, the initial houses, initial investigation based upon, like I said, if you, if you have a, a positive result here, you're gonna, you know, basically kind of circle around that and test water, you know, drinking water wells around there. That costs a fair amount of money, and then we're estimating we're gonna. So we're gonna. What we're thinking is, is so that's that's the three. Just just getting to that initial phase, get the sampling done, right? What we're expecting is that you know, as things kind of expand outward, it's like geometry that we'll we'll get up to like six fifty. We started so the ten million is really for the six hundred fifty total really 575 right because we're already paying 75 with the initial three million so okay. that's that's yeah right. this is this is just based on our our efforts and so that's why we're saying like if people are going to volunteer if we're initiating investigation we're going to pay for the poet system in a couple of years of all of and then you know based upon those results we'll know you know we'll have a good sense of what we what we believe the problem the problem is and then you know then we'll have to figure out how, how to go about doing that it could just be voluntary at that point we could say if we have a fund it's say test your well but that's getting too far down the road i don't want to i don't want to jinx us on that one. okay thank you representative sevens it's unfair um it's actually more of a, a process question i have I don't know if you have more slides or more things that yeah. you can. I don't, the only ones were our PFAS, which we've talked about, and then Brownfield. So there's not really, um, I don't know what's questions. going on with this thing. It's, it's yeah, well, I, yeah. Problem, so. I do too. What I, oh, and I just lost your presentation. Deja found. Did you take it down? <laughs> That's so funny. It was there and now it's gone. I, couldn't, I, could never. I, I had it. I'm going to try to read. had to log off and get back on. So anyway, oh, that was that Yeah, because I had the same problem. Back. Okay. At any rate, I refreshed it wouldn't come. Okay. At any rate, now I'm in. I don't even have our committee up. So <laughs> back to last year for some reason. Um, <laughs> uh, now I'm distracted. But you had a couple more slides actually under healthy homes that were into the budget request for this year that we missed. I think you probably just forgot that they were there, but they were the last couple. Okay. If, I think they would be important to revisit if we could. Okay. I'm trying to collectively get back to let me see if I reality. Can see if we do it gets us. The magic reboot, see if that gets us back. Very strange. I'll try. Yeah. Okay. I got it back up here. So it's spinning a wheel of death. Yours is not. Maybe, Representative Clifford, do you have yours? Just so it's a couple. Yeah, I, if I could just. Um, that you might have to keep pressing. Okay. Just the current, I think the current status funding, staffing, yeah. and then that. So, I can, so you yeah. do have these slides. So the the uh, so basically, yeah, this is how the ten million breaks down. So so eight million for healthy homes grants. Again, this applies to both the on-site and the uh, housing community uh, program. Wait, wait. Oh, yeah. Okay. Additional funding request numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So that I, I didn't know if we should go through the current status. Slides before that. 16 million total budget now. Five FTEs. Raise on the back. Slide 12. Uh, yeah. 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 Set it down. The screen might stay down. You just got to tap, it'll come back to you. So, yeah, so it's 8 million for those uh, grants, contracts, and beneficiary awards. Um, Going forward, the uh, manufactured home communities technical assistant contract. Uh, we, we'd like to bring on a contractor that can work with MHCs 
that lack technical knowledge and skills to, to basically get into the program. So again, this is, this is I won't say this is unique, but I, I think this is where I think we should be heading for a lot of these types of, of projects across the state is trying to help folks get to the money because you know wh where we sit, we typically see the same communities over and over because they're sophisticated and they have either have on on site staff or on their own staff or they hire really good consultants to get good grant applications and and so we're we're not serving a lot of people and I think we need to work on that so I think this is a good model for how we can how we can help communities get the funding that's out there. Um, we need we need to extend a couple of our so a lot a lot of the staffing needs were met by ARPA funds which are going to expire so we need we need more people so one billion is for uh, extending a couple of existing FTEs for two years and then um, another five hundred thousand to bring in additional FTE for three years so yeah we we like I said I think someone asked like well you know why didn't we get to all of them we, we need bodies you know we, we need some yeah. So is this, these are, is this a one time or is this in the base? Oh, okay. And just, I mean, I do think it's important. Maybe you did this, but for me, going back to the current status funding slide, number 12, 16 million total budget, you're asking for more on top of that, or it's in, it's in these two numbers that the MHC program is 24.75 million total budget. So the, so th this is the existing budget, the current status funding and staffing. So $16 million, five FTEs, that's for the on-site program. And you can see the breakdown, two and a half FT, uh, FTE for program administration, two for permitting, uh, the one for permitting compliance. And then the manufactured housing community program is a 24.7 million, 75 million total budget. And we need a one and a half if we have a more than half FTEs for program. So that's our existing budget. And what's your total staffing in the um, on site program? I can get that for you. I don't know off the top of my head. That would be good. Yeah. Um, so the next one was need. I think we, we, we kind of ran through this a little yeah. bit, but we, you know, there's need. This is not going away. You know, I mean, I, I don't. I, I hope that this program keeps going well beyond my tenure. I really do. I think this is a great program and we're helping a ton of people. And I think it's money well spent because it's, it's everything, right? I mean, hard to have, you know, a, a good life without having these basic needs met. So. Great. Thanks. So now we'd love to hear about Brownfields before we run out of time, <laughs> but we don't have slides for them. Uh, I, I, again, th these were very basic. These were John Gilling Productions. They're not nearly as, as uh, good looking as this. Um, Brownfields, you know, we 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 have experienced a, a pretty significant uptick in, in Brownfields funding requests over the last couple of years. Um, we estimate we could we could spend about eight million uh, in looking at both assessments and remediation. So the, the two and a half million, just just to break it down, um, we've asked for one million for assessment. And one and a half million for remediation. Um, you know, I think it's a reasonable request. There, there's other monies coming in. There's federal monies coming in. ACCD has some money for this. It's kind of a triangular approach. It's both economic development and environmental protection. Again, these these are great programs. I, I think um, of all the things I've worked on for healthy homes, I think brownfields provide the most bang for their buck. You know, you get. You know, you get properties cleaned up, you get them back into commerce, you can provide housing for people, you can provide jobs for people. And so you have these hulks, you know, lying around the state. We've got a lot of old little towns, and a lot of those properties are really ripe for redevelopment. It can provide a lot of benefits to Vermont. So it, it's this is money very well spent. Um, and that's this is one time money that would come through through DEC. Yeah. And in addition to what did we put in the BAA? Brownfields. Well, I'm testing my memory. I, it, well, I think it was a million. I thought it was more. I thought it was more. You know, you're right. I'll to, I, I just don't remember. Yeah, that's okay. We can find that too. I can, I can find that. Representative Bongart. Is, is this additional funding on top of base or is this it? So the, this and the, and the there, there is already, there is already money. In the yeah, okay, that's why. This is additional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there is a, yeah, a pretty big push right now. I think um, between a lot of things that are going on the housing side, 
um, and just in, in economic development in general to try to get a lot of city centers revitalized. So there's, there's a lot of interest. You know, we're seeing a lot of um, seeing a lot of folks you know coming to us and asking. And I should just mention the RPCs are very um, integral to this whole process. They do a lot of they help us an awful lot with these things. Present mm -hmm. Sibelia. I'm not sure if you didn't just answer my question, but uh, I heard you say there's increased um, interest in these funds. And my question was around why. And I think you just said um, addressing the housing pro pro problem uh, is one area. I, I wonder if, you know, the more money there is, the more interest there is. I mean, if, if you know, the... Yeah, I mean, just to give you, I get to have some examples here. There's a couple of housing projects in Rutland, which will create a combined total of 46 units of affordable housing. Uh, assessment costs at, at the two projects are expected to be upwards of $50,000 each. So we can help them as, uh, fund the assessment part. And then, then there's also funding to help with the cleanup. We do the cleanup. ACCD helps with, with other costs related to the development. So we're, we're, we're on the environmental side, we're on the, more of the development side. Sure. So just uh, new to this committee, uh, does the Brownfields work up EFAS? Just the Brown, well, Brownfields funding cleanup uh, EFA, EFAS. Potentially. You know, PFAS is, I mean, it, it really depends. There, there could be PFAS contamination at Brownfield sites. PFAS is a, is a weird contaminant. It's, not, you know, Brownfield sites, you typically associate with kind of industrial uses. So you have more like solvents, PCBs, lead, PHs, things of that nature. There can be PFAS, but PFAS is, is this weird chemical that's everywhere and, and it's distributed Aerial deposition, that's what happened in Bennington. Bennington, it came from a smokestack. It got on the ground and into the groundwater. It's not your typical, in my whole career, I, you basically find a site, it's contaminated, you trace it upstream, you find you know, a manufacturing facility or a gas station. You'd say, okay, A to B, that's where it came from. PFAS is very bizarre that way. But if there is PFAS or brownfield site, sure, this would cover clean up for it. But it's just the typical brownfield site is like an old mill or an old machine shop or something that has, you know, the more traditional suite of contaminants. And that's that's usually what the focus is. But you could have PFAS. Can, P can Brownfield's money be used to clean up a Absolutely. PFAS yeah. It, contamination? Yeah. It can. It can. I'm just saying that, that, so let's just take a scenario. You've got, you've got an old mill building and you find PFAS in the soils. You would certainly clean up the building and get the PFAS out of the soils. That's kind of unusual, right? And that, that would be like, that would be like, Saint Gobain, right? That would be like the old, you know, manufacturing plant that actually made things with PFAS. It, it's just, it's it, it, if it happens, yes. If we find it at a site, we'll clean up whatever's there. But I'm just saying, what we would expect to find would be kind of what we traditionally see at these old manufacturing facilities. That would be a kind of a classic brand. Thank you. So I just found our response to the BAA, and it was a million. Um, into the brownfield so yeah and committee we uh, identified areas that we needed to follow up on so we'll be talking about those as this budget moves forward representative stebbins thanks Mr. you mentioned um pcbs and i know um that house education has taken testimony in terms of what the status is for testing in schools yeah. i wonder what anr's or, or department of health plan is for what we find because i I mean, there are three schools that have found lepers thus far. I'm really worried that we're going to have like 80 plus schools and we don't have a plan. There is a plan in place, and I can share that with you. I can have uh, either Matt or Trish Coppolino get you there. there we have an approach to, to dealing with them. It's kind of phased and it, it's very, very site specific. Now, there are times when you know, Burlington's kind of worst case scenario, right? If you've got a situation where it's just infused throughout the building, that's that's one thing. I will tell you what 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 I'm hearing. Uh, we meet every week on this, and so it, what I'm hearing is that where they're finding it, it's typically where they find it above action levels. It's typically in sort of confined spaces, um, sometimes kitchens, uh, closets, things of that nature. We haven't found a lot of it where the kids are, which is great. 
you know, there, there's been a couple and that's, that's where it gets very challenging. But if it's just confined to one area, you can do it. You know, you can, you can still go to school safely and, and address the, P, that, the PCB contamination uh, in, in an orderly fashion. It's just, if we have a situation where it's, you know, endemic throughout the school, that's a problem. And, and we're going to need to, it, obviously the health, health of the children comes first and we need to address it. But there is, there, we do have an approach. We're in constant contact with the health department, with, with education. Um, so, you know, we're prepared and, and we are dealing with the schools where we found it and, and trying to help them along. But there is, there is a plan in place to get these things done. Can I ask a question? Can we switch gears to water? No. So we have a Brownfields question from Representative Morris, and then we'll switch gears to water, and then we'll take a break. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, my question is referencing Brownfields. And um, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, there, again, this is uh, another uh, very valuable program for the communities that are blessed with the industrial sites that you aforementioned earlier. And, uh, and including some in Burlington with the school, the PCBs that were found in the school, the, we have several industrial sites in Rutland. We all have them. Mm -hmm. And but traditionally, the cleanup for, uh, for those sites runs millions. Mm -hmm. And so when we, when we are only putting 1.5 for the 1 million for the assessment, 1.5 for the mitigation, and we have another million that's in the, in the budget adjustment, that's not even approaching a single site for cleanup. And so I'm wondering what the thought process is around brownfields and how do we how do we engage with our communities, get these sites back online for the economic development right. or housing that you're talking about? So so the state funding is not exclusive. There's a lot of federal funding for brownfields. And so that that is a big part of the puzzle, honestly. Um, that's actually what my wife does for the EPA. So she helps direct Brownfields funding to, you know, sites that qualify. So that's a lot of it. We, we help out, you know, we kind of chip in where we can. There's certain things we can do. We have maybe a little more flexibility than they do in terms of things that we can pay for. So we're really a, kind of a supplement to the federal program. And, and, and as I mentioned, ACCD has, you know, a significant amount of funding in this area. Um, you know, it'd be great if we had unlimited resources and we could pay for all of it. But I, we think this is kind of a reasonable approach, kind of given where we are right now. I mean, just so you understand, there's 165 sites enrolled in the program right now. Right? And so that, that represents a pretty significant increase over the last couple of years. We expect that's going to keep growing. So we just feel like on the balance, we can, we can, we can make this work, you know, now going forward and then, you know, hopefully continue some momentum. But I do think, these are really good projects. You get a lot out of them. You know, communities get a lot out of them. Everyone gets a lot out of them. We get the contamination out. We get productive use again. We get jobs. We get housing. You know, so they're, they're great projects. But I feel like this is kind of where, you know, where we are right now. But I think you're right. Going forward, I don't think this is the end. So it's kind of like healthy homes. I mean, there's a lot of brown fits out there. You know, I'm going to need to cut doing it incrementally. And, and my last advocacy would be that... Uh, uh, blessed with the PCB and the coolant contaminations and uh, coal tar oils and et cetera, et cetera. And now we're introducing the PFAS uh, contamination around the state that uh, emphasis will shift and the ones that are the older ones will get left behind. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have that much fear of that. You know, I, I just think because I, that's why I kind of just conceptually, I kind of see brownfields and PFAS as two separate issues. So there they could are. be brownfields that have PFAS problems, but to me, PFAS is kind of a whole different animal. It's a really challenging animal. Brownfield, you go there, you do the testing, you do the assessment, you find out what you got, you come up with a plan, you figure out how you're going to clean up, and then you figure out how you're going to redevelop it. And that's that's it. Boom, boom. You know, and it's, it's a good collaboration between private and public spending. And so I, 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 it's my hope. I don't see PFAS as going to all of a sudden divert from Brownfield. Brownfield is a separate train. It's been going a long time. It's, it's a long-standing program, and I think it's it's I think it's stronger now. I think hopefully it'll stay that way. So I have uh, one more question myself, and then I know get Representative Stebbins says too. Um, the Secretary indicated that um, vision directors are potentially holding positions open, um, but not at her direction. And I guess I um, the, the the disconnect there. I mean, are you are you as leadership indicating to your division directors not to hold those positions open? Because they work for you. They do work for me. And the buck stops with me. So I have not directed them not to do that. Have you directed to fill them? I, 
there are times when I have directed directors to film. But not consistently. That's not a... I, I had, I, I directed a director. <laughs> I directed an employee to fill two positions. So I do it. Uh, I'm, I, it's, it's challenging. And I'll tell you, the reason they do it, and some of them, is they're afraid of risks. And they feel like this is the best way they can protect existing personnel. That may not be the best strategy. I'm not defending it. But if you've ever been through something like that, you'll understand. Right? They don't want to fire people. So it, it's, it is a challenge. Um, and like I said, if it gets acute, then I step in. So far, I have chosen not to do it. I think it's only two things we're talking about here. Um, but you know, the, I think Julie does a better job of kind of explaining the big picture. But I'm just telling you, as, as their boss, I've chosen not to say, you have to do this. You know, um, there could come a time, you know, when I make that decision, I made that decision late last year. And so they're out for recruitment. So I can do it. Um, I have not done it to date. And part of it is I try to give them a lot of autonomy and I, and I, and I respect them. You know, I'm, I'm ephemeral, right? I'm gone. So these are people, these are career staff, you know, and they're protecting their people. So I, I'm somewhat hesitant to come in and say, you do what I say, um, even if it's counter to their instincts and counter to what they think the best interests of their program are. But it's challenging. Or is it counter to what you think should be happening? I think there's pluses and minuses to both. You know, um, you know, I, it's, it's, I struggle with it. I struggle with it, you know, and, and I, I kind of try to be measured in, in how I manage these folks. And it's something that I'm struggling with right now. You know, it's, it's, it's creating some questions. Um, those aren't the only you know, vacancies. I mean, there, there are other, I believe there's six, uh, six, vac- six positions that represent vacancy savings throughout the department. So we're only talking about two out of six. So it's, it's not just, and that's part of that's just how this budgeting stuff works. Again, this is, you know, I know a lot about the substance of this stuff. This, this part of it's not really where I've resided. So I, 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 I rely on, on my people and my people tell me this is how we do it. So we're not talking about a huge amount of positions. There, there, there was a time when it, that list got too long. And my predecessor said, you know, we got to, you got to fill it. And that happened. So it's, it's at a much smaller level now than it's been in the past. But it's, yeah, it's a difficult position to be in. Yeah. Representative Sibeli, I think, wants to follow up on this. <laughs> yes, I do. Um, so what is the measure? Um, of acute or too long in terms of so those were you you said that that's when you step in i i I had serious uh, there was a fear that they were they're going to lose those positions permanently that's that's what created a real what what is what does when does that happen that the there's a process called sweeps where the position is open too long you lose the position So, so i was in dire fear that that was about to happen so I made my direction. Okay. Um, I <clears throat> want to thank you for your testimony this morning and your work, um, Commissioner, on, in Vermont. Um, but I have to take exception um, with what I've just heard um, about career employees um, being the front line for determining the level of staffing um, and their. I understand and appreciate their desire to protect their colleagues and the workforce. Uh, my question would be who's protecting Vermonters? And uh, that question is answered every two years uh, in our election. Uh, and uh, the governor is elected and then appoints officials uh, to ensure that Vermonters are being protected. And uh, I believe that that is uh, secretary's job and your job to ensure that adequate staff is happening. And, and uh, you know, again, this is new to me, um, but have been on the receiving end in my communities of uh, not enough staffing or, uh, you know, <laughs> in my region, a permit that took a thousand days to be issued. What kind of permit was that? Uh, an Act 250 permit. Okay. Um, a thousand days for an individual who's single uh, when he applied and was married with two children when the permit came through. And so 
uh, I would just take exception with, um, with what you're describing here as the process for ensuring um, that these uh, positions are filled. I work in economic and community development and workforce development, and I'm acutely aware of the shortages that we have in personnel in our state. And, you know, <laughs> that to me requires not a sitting back. That requires a leaning in um, for this. So thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, I, as I indicated, the buck does stop. Them. So it's appropriate that, that you express your displeasure to me. I, I'm just telling you that in my position, I try to balance a lot of things and it's not an easy, it's not an easy call to make, but I appreciate your concern. Yeah, I mean, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. I, I'm, if I might just continue, I mean, I'm, I am really distressed. I say this part. But this is something that we are talking about in terms of our budget letter um, and any other means that we have to affect this. I mean, it's not appropriate as far as I'm concerned. So with that, I'm sorry, we really need to break. I, I mean, we need to transition to our next witnesses. Can we invite him back? Yep. Because we didn't touch on water at all. And we heard like <clears throat> Champlain for like an hour and a half on all the funding that's disappearing and the staff that isn't there. Yes. So but we so don't have time to do that right this second. I'm sorry. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for your testimony. <clears throat> yeah, members, we, let's take a, a three minute break, please. All right, we're going to reconvene our meeting and uh, continue talking about the budget with. Uh, conservation districts, and I believe Jill Arachi will start. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. I'm Jill Arachi, the executive director of the Vermont Association of Conservation Districts, and I have two colleagues, uh, district managers, with me. I think it would be good for them to introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Jennifer Byrne. I'm the district manager of the White River Conservation District um, down in Orange and part of Windsor County. And good morning, I'm Lauren Weston. I'm the district manager for the Franklin County Natural Resources Conservation District. Welcome. Thank you. Our district managers will be doing most of the talking, so I'd like to invite Jennifer to start and I'll be here to help answer questions. Lauren has a PowerPoint which she'll be sharing with you. Great, thank you so much. So um, we'll be doing a, a very brief introduction to the conservation districts and our current um, appropriations request uh, that we are here today to request be included in your, in your budget memo. Uh, you can go ahead to the next slide. So conservation districts, were really created out of the Dust Bowl era um, back in the 30s. Uh, the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, uh, then the Soil Conservation Service, which is now the Natural Resource Conservation Service, uh, were out on, on the landscape and they quickly realized that in order to extend conservation assistance to more landowners and land stewards and farmers, they believed that the solution was to establish democratically organized soil conservation districts to lead the conservation planning effort at the local level. Um, so that's really where we come from. We are subdivisions of state government. We are run by an elected board of five residents of our districts. So across the country, there's over 3,000 conservation districts. Here in Vermont, there are 14, um, one for every county, but some of us are watershed based. Um, so we are really rooted in the communities. Uh, we cover all of Vermont um, and we have over 60 staff right now across all the districts and, and the Vermont Association of Districts. And uh, we work with landowners and land stewards to make management and conservation decisions. We, we also work with towns and conservation commissions um, and, and help provide, we work right at the juncture of private, state and federal money and try to really piece everything together to move projects along. Um, we connect people and organizations and resources, um, and we cover a whole the gambit of natural resources. So soil, water, air, plants, animals, humans, and energy. Um, you can go to the next slide. 
So this is, believe it or not, the easiest way we can explain our structure. Um, we are overseeing, if you see at the bottom, you know, the uh, landowners came together back in the 30s to form the actual districts. Um, and it, it maintains, you know, that level of leadership today. Uh, so we're overseen at the local level by our elected supervisors. And then at the state level, uh, the Vermont Natural Resources Conservation Council, the NRCC, is really our state agency. Uh, it is considered an agency of the state, I should say. And uh, on that council sits uh, a designee from ANR, a designee from Agency of Ag, um, a, the uh, director of the state extension, and then four uh, of our elected supervisors um, also sit on the council. So um, I believe you can go to the next slide. This year, the 14 conservation districts are requesting a base appropriation of $3 million for fiscal year 24 uh, to cover ongoing operational costs that are necessary to meet our statutory obligations. This year alone, we wrote 168 grants to fund our work. Um, and so this core funding is really going to be crucial for us um, to continue to provide service in, in the community. And next slide, please. So increasing the NRCC's budget to $3 million um, would be able to allow for the coverage of the district manager's salaries and providing benefits to us and our staff, um, really retention of uh, our agricultural and conservation specialists and, uh, and recruitment and training of new staff members. Um, we do a lot of community engagement. Um, and so uh, being able to, you know, provide per diems and reimbursements for speakers and, and participants to, uh, as we conduct our outreach and, and community assessments that are uh, part of our legislative mandates, um, as well as some technology needs and software upgrades um, and administrative and grant management capacity support. Um, we leverage a lot of funding uh, for federal uh, match. This, this appropriations would really uh, help us to uh, ach access the federal money that's coming. There's, there's quite a great deal of funding out there um, that we don't wanna leave on the table. Um, so we are here today to request that we're, we be included in your budget memo. Um, our current request is through the Agency of Ag's budget uh, since NRCC is, is currently embedded under the agriculture budget. In many years past, we were under ANR's budget. Um, so uh, we and we continue to work very closely with ANR and and access and and uh, distribute a lot of their their funds, their grants in our communities. Um, so uh, we also have submitted info onto your website uh, regarding this ask that uh, gives a little bit more background and information on this. Next slide. I think I hand it over to Chell. Just wanted to recap. Thank you very much. Last year, the legislature gave us an additional 250,000 to NRCC's uh, core funding, which enabled us to more than double what the base funding we give districts every year to $20,000 per year, which is very valuable for districts. It enables them to do things like meet landowners and communities, provide services that aren't funded by a specific grant, manage their board meetings, things like that, um, conduct research. Next slide, please. In addition to that 250,000, we received 248 in one-time funding. This was for capital and equipment needs, so tr um, some trucks to enable districts to do more out in the field, including their tree plantings, which you see highlighted here, as well as a, a building in Pultney Meadowway. Uh, next slide, please. I'm handing back to Lauren now. Hello again. Um, so with this with this request for additional funds, we hope to continue to do our great work in our communities. Conservation districts work in different program areas based on their community needs. Um, so many of us work in natural resources, restoration and conservation. Um, this can look like working on lake shores, stream banks, riparian areas, forests and other projects that typically have water quality and habitat benefits. Um, this also includes tree plantings. For instance, uh, my district is planning to plant about 12 acres of trees this spring. We also have about 12,000 trees and shrubs 
that we are planning uh, to sell, that we are selling to private landowners for them to plant on their own lands through our annual tree sale. Um, the photo you see in the top left is um, actually of a project that we just completed at Lake Carmi to restore an area of the lake shore to a natural condition. We also work in stormwater, and so the project uh, the, in the image shown here is from Caledonia County. It was designed to treat stormwater that's collected in municipal drainage systems to reduce phosphorus and other contaminants. Before this project, the water was being released untreated into the Lamoille River. And so we all work with towns and other landowners to help address their stormwater treatment needs, including long roads, parking lots, and other drainage systems. We also work to educate people about environmental issues and ways that they can be more responsible landowners and land users. This can look like hosting events with speakers on a variety of topics, engaging the community through outreach at existing events such as field days, and connecting one-on-one -on -one with landowners. Um, this photo is of a camp owner who received a LakeWise certification and sign, which means that they are doing a great job helping water quality and natural resources for their lake on their own property. And we also work in agriculture. Um, we help farmers transition to more sustainable ag practices and help them to better understand how they can reduce nutrients from leaving their lands to improve water quality. I think we have a question on this. Representative Stebbins. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. We heard quite a bit uh, from the Lake Champlain, I can't remember the name, <laughs> Um, the Lake West program, how many staff does that have? My understanding is that that uh, program currently has two full-time staff. And we're contracted to do the actual certification going out and working with landowners. Um, so we get that funding through, currently my district's funded to, through the L the Lake Watershed Action Plan. Um, that's how we get funding to go out and do the certifications and work with landowners. Thank you. Sure thing. All right, moving on. Um, so how do we do all this great work? Um, so we work towards improving water quality, soil health, economic viability in the rural economy, and climate resilience. We do this by building trust and long-term relationships with landowners, farmers, towns, and other partners to help them make decisions for their lands. We work with them to assess concerns and opportunities, become educated, uh, plan and provide technical assistance, design projects in-house or hire consulting engineers, and implement and monitor projects with contractors and other experts. And then we use these experiences and relationships to, sh to share information back out to policymakers and program designers. Uh, for instance, many district managers are currently providing critical leadership by serving as chairs of their respective basin water quality councils uh, that have changed the way clean water project funding is dispersed in Lake Champlain and then for Magog watersheds. Uh, this work to improve water quality, soil health, economic viability, and climate resilience in Vermont is continuous and growing due to, due to demand. Conservation districts are able to help people who need assistance making these decisions and accessing resources. And it's something that we love to do. With that, um, thank you very much. And we'll take any questions. Do members have questions for Conservation District? The, the, of Sevilla. the increase in base funding was yeah. 2 million? 3 million. <clears throat> for what's in the governor's recommend? Apologies, trying to find the right slide here. Um, we are requesting an increase to $3 million. And do you know what's in the governor's budget? Uh, 3,062. So we previously had 12,000 plus that 250,000 added. What, 3,000 to 3 million? Three, 300, yeah, 360,000. Oh, sorry, 300,000, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Oh. So as of until last year, the districts were only receiving about $112,000 that we were dividing up among the 14 districts um, from the state. Everything else is grant uh, funded. Last year, we did get an increase to $360,000. Um, and this year, we're, we're asking for the, the full $3 million. We asked last year as well. Um, we're, we're just a little late. <laughs> So does anyone know what's in the budget, the governor's budget recommend? 
362,000. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Sebelia. Yes, uh, the 3 million, um, where is, where, where are those funds? Do you know where the 362 uh, in funding comes from? Is that general fund? Is that one-time funds? And do you have a sense of where the 3 million it would be coming from and how that would be sustained? The 362 is general funds. Okay. Uh, and with the, the 248 that we received this year was one-time fund for the capital and equipment. And we, um, we have not, um, uh, we would like the 3 million to come from general funds so that it's uh, continuing uh, funding as base funding for conservation districts. We don't, at this point, we don't have even one staff member funded full-time uh, for basic services. Uh, those staff are fundamentally funded by grants. So our, our preference would be general funds, but we've left it up to the appropriations committees to decide where those funds will come from. Okay, so clarification is uh, going to 3 million would eliminate the need to seek grant funding to pay for the staffing of the commissions. Well, thank you for that question. Our goal is that the grant funding would be for technical assistance and projects on the ground, and that this core funding would fund things that either require very small grants that are an inefficient use of time to administer, uh, might replace some of those very small grants, and have the grant writing focus on project implementation. So we're looking for uh, um, management time, research time, uh, community relationship building time, administrative time so how much of your oh, <clears throat> your current budget would i mean what is your current budget amongst our the current budget is about three million so you're looking for general fund dollars to cover the totality of the 14 districts current budgets and to expand conservation district staff significantly to meet the new challenges that are coming with additional programs so we wouldn't be seeking to replace some of the grants we have. Some of the grants we have, just to give you examples, are we have funding from the Agency of Ag for Ag Technical Assistance staff. We have funding from DEC um, for uh, clean water project design and implementation. Uh, those are two of our, lar our largest grants. We have funding from DEC, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, for tree planting projects. We have funding from NRCS for stream restoration projects. So we would continue to have those grants, but we would want the staff time to manage the district programs and grow the district staff so that we can do more, basically, and, and not have our district managers spending a lot of time managing a bunch of smaller grants that I haven't even mentioned because there's too many. <laughs> Jennifer, it looks like you might add yeah. something. I, I would add, and I wonder if we could pull up, we have a breakdown of the ask and, and the different uh, uh, chunks of money and how we got to the three million. Maybe we could share that. Um, uh, that is in our. Yep, yeah, that's important. Yeah, yeah, that's what is the document called because we have it on our web page. Okay, good. So yes, yeah, so it's a, in that it's highlighted uh, uh, training, um, community engagement, board and supervisor engagement, compensation, equipment and facility upgrades, uh, leadership expenses, uh, management at uh, council. Right now, council is essentially an unfunded state agency. There used to be a staff position um, that was eliminated some years ago. We'd love to restore several staff positions to help districts manage all this work and be the stronger link between the, the districts and the state government. Can you just confirm which document you're looking at? We're looking at the one that says FY 2024 NRCD's appropriations request. Okay, NRCD. And, and I would say in, in regard to uh, covering staff time, we're, we're really thinking of uh, the, the district manager's time needing to be what's covered. We have staff, some, every district is different. My district has seven staff currently. Um, so it would just be a, um, take a lot of the burden off of our grants um, if my salary was covered more you know, in a standard way. Um, as you know, a subdivision of state government, um, and you know our positions are also listed in our statute, 
Um, so, you know, uh, instead of me kind of gleaning from every grant that I administer, um, it, it would be a more efficient use of our funds and our time um, to just use our grant funding for the staff that are working on deliverables on those grants. We had a process where we went out to all the districts and asked them to submit budgets for what they needed. And that was where the three million came from. We did that over the summer, last summer. So there's specific requests from each district um, according to their plans and priorities. Um, I, are any of the districts serving as the clean water service providers in their area? Uh, Pulteney Meadowy District is in partnership with Rutland uh, Regional Planning Commission as the clean water service provider. Thank you. And districts are uh, represented on the Basin Water Quality Councils. And in many cases, the district manager is actually the chair or the vice chair of the Basin Water Quality Council. Any of them it would be good for us to count that number, the majority of them, I would say. <laughs> yeah, it, it would be good to know where you are filling in those, um, filling those kinds of roles for us to understand and put this request into perspective. Yeah, I, I would add there's some, I'm, I'm from a side of the state where we don't have the councils yet, but um, I know that there is hesitancy to take on the workload since we have a great deal of workload already. So to actually become the council itself, you know, we, we'd need a whole other staff position to do that. Great. And um, I just want to follow up on one more thing, which is this, this is in the, your, your base budget with the governor is in the Agency of Agriculture's, is it, did I get that right? That's, right? That's right. Okay, and I assume you're taking this ask to the Agriculture Committee? Yes, we have as well, yes. Okay, um, Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, it took me a minute to figure out you're actually not a state agency, because um, it sounds like you're doing a lot of work that maybe state agencies would normally do? Is that a fair that's, assumption? That's a great question. Uh, districts are technically um, um, local governmental entities and council is the framework, the State Natural Resource and Conservation Council is the framework through which districts um, were incorporated effectively and, and approved. But we think of districts as a conservation delivery system because we're statewide and actually nationwide. And we have a close partnership with the USDA, US Department of Agriculture, Natural Resources Conservation Service. Many districts have offices uh, provided by NRCS. Um, so it, it does, we're technically local governmental entities and NRCC is a state agency, but currently unfunded with any general funds, just funded with these grants that come through the Agency of Agriculture. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for um, joining us this morning. I appreciated the question about roles. We have many roles where we're facilitating basin planning, regional coordinators, coordination among technical assistance providers, uh, um, uh, engaging landowners and providing feedback to both state and governmental entities. So that's also another role that conservation districts play. Yeah, and I'm pretty familiar with your work, um, but I do think that um, that would help make your case if we understood all the niches that you are filling in, even if it's, I know it's different by district, but, um, and it, it, it gets complicated pretty, pretty quickly, but uh, I think that would help, help us understand this ask better. So oh, maybe you could get us something. <clears throat> Excuse Absolutely. Me. Would you like something district by district? Maybe yeah, a little summary? I think a, an overview of the niche in each district is filling would be very helpful to this consideration. Great. We'd be happy to do that. Thank yeah, you great. very much yeah. for your time. And we're happy yes. to answer any other questions. Yeah, unfortunately, we need to move on because we have another <laughs> budget dive to take on. Thank you. Understood. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye. All right, members, we're gonna um, shift gears and welcome the Natural Resources Board Chair, Sabina Haskell, and uh, Executive Director Peter Gill to join us. Rachel Lamont. And Rachel Lamont. Oh, perhaps Rachel will be 
the week. You all can take it from here. Um, want to start? Just do some introductions. Sure. sure. Just once again, I'm Sabina Haskell, the chair of the Natural Resources Board. And my name is Rachel Lamonico. I'm the business director for the Natural Resources Board. And Pete Gill, executive director for the Natural Resources Board. Morning. morning. So, morning. And we were asked to come and give a brief overview of our budget proposal, current staffing levels, and some of the special projects that we have ongoing at the Natural Resources Board currently. So this is a presentation that's on the screen behind me that we gave to the House Appropriations Committee last week. We may not go through every one of these slides. I, you'll, you might be happy to hear that, but it um, definitely hits the highlights of what we were asked to present today and include some additional information that you can peruse at your pleasure. Um, so just a brief <clears throat> overview of all the slides that are included in this presentation, but we'll probably stick to the first few, which really address the um, information that you requested that we give to you today. Um, so just as a background, I know this committee is very familiar with Act 250, but for those of you who may not be, um, you know, the primary mission of the Natural Resources Board is to administer Act 250. Um, we do that through reviewing applications for subdivision and development projects for compliance with the Act 250 criteria. We do approximately 400 application reviews every year. The state is split into nine regional districts um, under which there are um, staff and governor appointed commissioners that, that are within each district that review applications that are for projects within those districts. Um, and our natural resources staff is composed of 25 positions funded through a combination of our special fund and general fund. In addition to that, we have three additional limited service positions, which are funded through a one-time ARPA appropriation, which I'll get to maybe on the next slide. Um, and we also have 60 citizen commissioners who are really the deliberative personnel who review Act 250 applications in collaboration with our staff. For the FY24 budget, we're requesting um, just over $3.4 million. Those are sourced, 20% of that is sourced from the, an appropriation from the general fund and 80% is sourced from our special fund, which is related to our Act 250 application fees primarily. Um, the Appropriations Committee asked for us to itemize our carry forward funds, how much money we carry forward from fiscal year to fiscal year. Last year, we had a very small amount, just over $15,000. We anticipate the same to be true at the turn of the next fiscal year this summer. Um, and that'll give me a segue into some of our priorities for the next year, the first of which is. Act 182 of 2022, which directed the Natural Resources Board to prepare a legislative report on the necessary improvements to the Act 250 program. That report is due to the legislature at the end of 2023. And I will <laughs> include here that the governor's FY24 recommended budget includes a one-time appropriation for the Natural Resources Board to hire a facilitator to help with that process. Um, there's a $200,000 one-time appropriation in the governor's recommended budget for that. Is that in, excuse me, is that included in the general fund ask? 
or no separate separate. Any other questions about that before? Representative Sibelia. Just um, where would I find information about the process for that? The process for the one-time appropriation or the study? Yeah. Um, there is not anything in writing yet, but there will be very shortly. We're doing all the kickoff planning and um, looking at the scope of work and the RFP process that we'll have to go through um, the feet of if the legislature approves the funding, it would not be available until July 1. Um, so uh, give a little time to just pull all of that together because it would be in the next fiscal year. And that would imply then that your process would be less than six months. Um, we're yes and no because we're. I mean, I'm definitely. A lot of us are digging in already and getting a lot of the groundwork, kind of just how we want to do it, and then we'll have to hire and do all of that. So, yes and no. I mean, but I have a timeline that I think can work and get us still be on time for the report. Okay. Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, I know you guys came before and explained your structure, but now that we just heard some A&R budget and we're hearing your budget, um, can you help clarify for me, your budget doesn't fall under them, but how basically your board looks to them for permits or can you clarify for me how those two pieces connect and don't? Yeah, the Natural Resources Board and the Agency of Natural Resources are two different state agencies, um, separate purpose of budgetary considerations as well as permitting, but they are probably our closest um, sister agency. And there are certain agency of natural resources permits that satisfy certain criteria in the Act 250 process. So those, um, if an applicant receives a wastewater permit, that could be evidence that is provided to under an Act 250 review for compliance with certain criteria. That's generally how it works. They are a stakeholder in our application review process. So it would file comments under most applications, um, but they're not part of our regulatory uh, body. They're a stakeholder in that process. So when I hear concerns about how long the permitting process takes, is that probably a mixture of both what's going on at a &R and then also perhaps what's going on at the district NRB? <coughs> <laughs> it really honestly depends on the situation. It could be ANR, it could be something happening at the municipal level, it could be something happening at the applicant level, it could be it just it really each each permit is we look and see what, what's missing and try to keep it moving forward, but we're sort of a catch-all, if you will. So yeah. I think what's what Chair Haskell is trying to say is that um, we rely on a, on a variety of different stakeholders in the Act 250 review process, and their timelines become our timelines, you know, and there's some, some of that where, you know, there might be constraints internally or externally in that process, and each permit or each project that goes through the process has its own specific um, uh, problems that it needs to overcome. Uh, thanks. So I'll move on to some of the organizational improvements that we're focusing on. Um, the first is that we, in 2022, we did launch an online application portal um, and new database system for Act 250 and the Natural Resources Board. We did that in coordination with the Agency of Digital Services. All of our applications are now filed online and we eliminate the need to file any paper copies with our office. Um, and we have a new enhanced database that really improves our data tracking capabilities. Um, and that's something that we're very excited about. Um, in addition, you asked specifically about our digitization project. Um, which is 
currently ongoing. The Natural Resources Board was awarded a one-time ARPA appropriation of $500,000 to digitize our permit files in two of our nine Act 250 districts. Um, really, the overarching goals of those that project are to make our records readily available to the public, to permanently preserve our records, and to reduce our storage space long term. Um, that $500,000 appropriation is likely to be expended in FY24, <coughs> but the governor's FY24 <coughs> budget includes a one time appropriation of a million dollars to the Natural Resources Board to continue with that project. We have the momentum now and it's a great opportunity for us to, as we've ramped up, to continue that work. So when you say to continue that work, two districts, are the two districts gonna be complete with the 500? That is our hope, yes. That's a lot of money for digitizing. And which districts were they? The first two districts are District 4 in Chittenden County and District 7, which covers the Northeast Kingdom. Okay, so potentially our largest and our smallest? Yes. Okay. Uh, and um, how many more would the million cover? I think <coughs> two to three other districts, depending on which districts we choose. Like, as you said, there's different volumes in each district. <laughs> um, so it depends on which districts we choose, but likely two to three. So that would only get us to halfway through the project mm -hmm. between the mm -hmm. appropriation and the additional million in the governor's FY24 budget, we'd be approximately halfway through. And the additional million is in general funds request. <laughs> yes. Representative Sibili. Yep. So uh, once the records are digitized, who will have access to those? So there's, well, we will have access to a digital copy, which we'll make available on our public database. The ultimate goal is to transfer the paper versions of those records to the state archives. We've laid the groundwork in our records management, record schedules to be able to inventory those files and um, go off to a vendor to be scanned and eventually make it to Middlesex to be uh, for the final resting place to be in the archives. <laughs> and we'll have digital copies available to the Natural Resources Board as well as the archives. So you'd be able to search those files in e either place. So, so I, they'll be available to the, to the public, to the um, consultants who need to use those files rather than traveling to the district, they'll be able to access them online. We'll have them available. Well, that was going to be my question. So they'll be available to the public mm -hmm. from their home. Yes. Or place of business. Mm -hmm. And now if you want to see those records, uh, where do you have to go? In person, you would have to go to. How, how do you see those records if you're uh, one of my constituents in Wardsboro? Our website, you would be able to access them digitally. Yeah, through right, now. right now. Right, right now, you would go to one of the district offices. So you'd, you'd have to get in your car and go to the actual office. They're in file. Uh, in you know, Springfield. File, yeah. So in right in Springfield. Yeah or in uh, um, the Essex office for D4, depending on which office you're in, which district you're talking about, you go to different uh, offices throughout the state. You'd have to physically go in to, to uh, see those files. Is there anyone who can do that for you? I mean, like, I guess I haven't filled out a permit, but work. Is it literally up to you to drive to the district office to get the records? Okay, thank you. Representative Bungard, so how far back will this go? Back to 1970. So all all files is what we're everything that's in hard copy. <laughs> Onion screens, yeah. Yeah. Representative Simmons. That's interesting. Um, do people often reference past projects for future projects? Mm -hmm. All the time. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. So the, the permit history on a site can be very important when you're planning the next phase of the mm -hmm. project. So um, they are referenced quite often. For any of the amendments to, a, to an existing permit, you can go back and see um, the previous, previous uh, files. Which for new members and for all of us, it might be helpful. I mean, I think you said there's something like 400 
reviews of projects. Many of those today are amendments to existing permits. They're not new projects. Do you have a breakdown on that different number? Uh, how many new projects a year? Yeah. I don't have a number in front of me, but look at that for you. But you're correct that the vast majority of the reviews that we do every year is an amendment to an original application. Which can make the archive even more important. It, yes, yep. exactly. Okay. So the last bullet point here um, is our limited service staff positions. Um, that Natural Resources Board was awarded <clears throat> a one-time ARPA appropriation to hire three limited service positions, one executive director, and two district coordinators. Our district coordinators are our technical staff that work with the district commissions to review applications. Those two limited service um, district coordinator positions, really the intent is to deploy those um, deploy those two positions statewide to facilitate the review of ARPA funded projects without delay to our other applications that may not have an ARPA funding component. Um, those positions are funded through the end of 2025. Very happy to have them. Mm -hmm. um, and we're currently tracking ARPA <coughs> projects to help you know, fit them to position them to help our staff um, alleviate some of these bottlenecks that may result. Representative Stebbins, can you give an example of an ARPA funded project? Um, many of the Green School Initiatives projects have an ARPA funding component. There are also ARPA funding um, housing projects. Um, and there are a variety of clean water initiatives, either. Uh, water, wastewater projects or stormwater projects. Those are the main um, type of projects that we know um, may have an Act 250 component to them. I actually don't know what a green school initiative is. I think, well, do you want to speak to that? Go or? ahead and I'll, I'll fill in what I know. What I know is um, HVAC initiatives. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. <clears throat> And there might be other upgrades that relate to um, school pandemic response. But I think primarily what we've seen so far getting funding is HVAC kind of project. The role of NRB or Act 250 in reviewing an upgrade to an HVAC at a school is we what? <laughs> we may not be. Oh. Okay. But they're on, you know, we'd evaluate a variety of different projects, and many of them may not need Act 250, others may. I guess I'd be surprised if a school had an Act 250 permit. I mean, given the municipal 10-acre disturbance, I mean, that, that would be shocking to me. So I, <laughs> Very few do, yeah. Some that do and some that don't. Right. Yep. yep. And then it's a matter of material change analysis, and like Rachel said, it, it may or may not trigger Act 250 amendment jurisdiction. Uh, depending on if what we're doing right now is making sure that we've got a master list of all the potential ARPA funded projects. So we don't leave any, any behind. We don't leave any money on the, on the table um, to make sure that each of those are addressed. If they are, then uh, Act 250 projects. So a school with a Act 250 permit, would that be a private school? Is that what, I mean, I, I guess I'm having a hard time with this. I'd like to know how many schools might be we're talking about. Um, Subject to an Act 250. There are municipal schools that do have Act 250 permits associated. With oh. It's not every school that does. Um, and really, most of those schools were in existence prior to the enactment of Act 250. So the jurisdictional trigger, I'm getting into the weeds, would be a substantial change to a pre existing development I know, rather but, than yeah, I, years of disturbance in and of itself as a municipal project. But I think this is a very small subset of what we would actually think might need an Act 250 permit. There, as Peter said, you know we're looking at a master list of where the ARPA funding is being doled out by other state agencies. Don't want to ignore a project if it does need it, but I, I'm not um, 
Green Schools initiatives is going to be a very small component. Uh, you know, it would be a rarity if Act 250 would trigger on those kinds of projects. But they're the ones who have been, uh, they're the ones who've gotten, that are using the ARPA money first. So they're showing up on our list before other projects are. <clears throat> Okay. I, I, just as follow up, I'd like to know how many of those there might be right now in your world. Yep. Uh, Representative Sibelia. Topic. Yep. Uh, uh, on the ARPA funded positions, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to double check. Uh, the executive director is whom? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, ARPA funded is um, temporary. So do we have a plan for? keeping that going? Well, I'll jump in. We're doing the Act 250 study that is due at the end of December and certainly staffing and fees and all the makeup of the operations is all be going to be a big component of that study. Can you remind me again, Sabina, when we would see- The study? Out, no, the outline of what the study will contain. Um, how we will know how we can provide yeah yeah it'll be it'll be it'll be in the next couple of months I'm, I'm i've got my kitchen sink list right now it needs to be cleaned up <laughs> so so will we have an opportunity to they can share the process <clears throat> with you if that's what that's what i'm hearing you say you are hearing me say that yes. yeah i mean i think so why would we not do that and make sure that it's yeah no I I'm, I'm hearing you say that yes yeah I mean yeah. I'm sure I yeah. that that's yeah. right yeah absolutely okay great I think um we covered the main highlights of our of the information that you wanted to hear from us today including our budget proposal current staffing levels the um, progress report on the digitization study and progress report on the Act 182 legislative report due at the end of the year. Is there any other questions? Um, well, thank you for sharing the whole document with us. And since you did, um, can we, and we have a couple of minutes, I'd love to walk through the crosswalk and just look at that. Oh, sorry. So the FY23 to FY24 crosswalk, you can see that we have um, some additional personnel expenses and a small amount of additional operating expenses. The personnel expenses are really related to increases in salaries, a reduction in vacancy savings target, reclassification of two existing staff positions. And we have filled quite a few open positions over the last several months that resulted in some competitive hiring. Um, What's the reclassification? For our enforcement officers, we have two existing enforcement officer positions. They were reclassified um, from pay grade 24 to pay grade 25. Oh, I see. Just yeah, yeah. Okay. pay grade request, but yeah. not a different. Okay. And our operations increases are really due to <clears throat> rental increases, as well as um, some of our ADS charges are moving around, moving from personnel expenses to operating expenses. So um, one bucket to the other. Right. Not a wholesale change from FY23, but there are some differences. So help me understand this crosswalk. I'm not, I, I'm, I do not. The top and the bottom. Yeah, so 23 is, the top green line is the 23 budget at 3.2. And then the bottom is the 24 recommend at 3.4. And that's, okay, so we're not, it's not a, Huge difference. Correct. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay, so I, I got it. <laughs> yeah, maybe not the most intuitive, but yeah, you interpreted it correctly. Yeah. 
Do members have questions or further items that they would like to ask the folks from the NRB while they're here? Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Masha. Recognizing that you have your kitchen um, sink uh, and that you haven't even done the outline yet, um, you have worked there for a little while and been chair for a little while. Uh, do you expect to see opportunities for um, improvements in, um, I don't want to say, well, yes, efficiency, but I don't mean that to say, you know, uh, I don't mean to say that we should be squeezing something even further. What I mean to be saying, you know, sometimes there are opportunities to streamline things, to make things more efficient. I think that there are um, opportunities to be more efficient operationally. I mean, digitizing the files is a perfect example. We have a year under our belt with the database and that those, those will definitely make big, big changes. Um, the, we're going to be uh, looking at the, um, the additional two staff members and what that means in terms of uh, productivity and efficiency. Um, there's often been conversations about is is there enough staff at the NRB? So that this will be a nice, you know, pilot look at that. Um, there is a lot of conversation from different constituency groups, different stakeholder groups about the level, you know, different, is there a way to do different levels of review with, are there things that could be exempted? That's, that's a conversation that everybody has to be at the table for. Does that answer your question? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for your work and for um, this really helpful detailed summary report of the budget. It's great. Thank, Thank you. you. And we'll, we'll be back with a, a process document of the study. Yeah. Can you give us, I don't want to, uh, but what's your approximate timeline on that? Uh, I'll be able to tell you next week. Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Thank you again. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Members have further um, comments or discussion before we adjourn for the morning. Not seeing any. So with that, we will.